Hello, everybody, and welcome to the second live stream. Um, hello to everybody that is in the chat. We've got somebody from Amy from Kansas, Australia, all over the place. Um, welcome. Uh, yeah, so this is the second live stream. Um, I'm feeling slightly less nervous this week, which is great. Um, so let's get straight into it. My guest this evening is the wonderfully entertaining Steve Berg. You may know him from his fantastic podcast, High Strangeness, where he sits down once a week with some of the most interesting people from the worlds of the paranormal and Fortiana. He's also an actor and a comedian and has appeared in movies such as Don't Worry Darling and the new film Snack Shack. And one day I hope to see him in the starring role as Bill Moore before the 1989 MUFON conference in Las Vegas. <laughs> as well as all that, he's also a high strangeness researcher with a focus on his home state of Nebraska and over the years has collected many strange and wonderful tales which he presents in his weird Nebraska lectures. With all of that being said, I'm very happy that he agreed to be my guest this week. So let's welcome in Steve Berg. Hello. Hello. How are you? You know, I was going to wear this pin. I love it. It's a uh... Don't what be ridiculous. It's, did, you, did you see Perfect Strangers as a kid? Maybe you didn't have that in the UK. I don't think so. I think this is oh. just an American thing. Yeah, well, we'll we'll send you the DVDs because it's it's good. It's really good. <laughs> and that was the catchphrase of Valky Bartakamos. Sorry, anyway. <laughs> but I want to say I love the, the is that the never ending story theme? No, it's not, but it's something that I found on uh, Epidemic Sound, um, which is like the music subscription thing that I use like to do put music in videos. And it's something that sounds so similar. And it, I was like, this like is amazing. Couple notes off. Yeah, it sounds so similar and it's copyright free, which is great. Well, let me tell you, it really lets the world around you melt away and gets you really right? in the zone for a right. wonderful live stream about weird topics. And then I and then I put in like the really tense countdown. Yeah. So I get like all psyched up with like the never ending story music and then the countdown music comes on and then I start to feel nervous again. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's like finish Just your thought, spaghetti, uh, it's about ready to go down. <laughs> like, you know. Just trying to keep myself on my toes. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for agreeing to come on and be my guest I'm on a the huge second fan. live stream. Thank you. This is a huge honor. I'm so happy to be here. We've got a lot to talk about, and I feel like we're going to go off in a million different directions mm -hmm. during this conversation, which is going to be great. But to begin with, let's start with who is Steve Berg and what got you into this subject right. to begin with, like going way back to the childhood days. Oh my goodness gracious. Uh, well, as my mother likes to remind me, uh, my mom was a school, a school teacher and she was a big reading advocate. And so she took me to get my first library card when I was five years old. And I don't really remember this, but my mom tells me I came back with uh, like a, I think it probably was, I kind of remember it like a Billy Meyer picture book and then a book about performing magic and i was just one of these i think i grew up with no religion in my household so i was always like looking for something fantastical and ufos and the paranormal were it and so i was just like a nut for this stuff you know i was like determined to read a read above my level just so i could like understand this stuff better and oh, and so i mean. bought all of it like every <laughs> single story bigfoot you Hook, name line it. And sinker. Yeah, i would come downstairs <laughs> like tell my dad who's like a very like rational you know like logical person like dad well, should we talk about this stuff you know and he's like good lord you know so yeah it, it's, <laughs> it's one of those things where like how i'm into this stuff and what i like about it has changed drastically you know Absolutely. like name but um yeah i feel like most people who have some oh, I don't know, I probably sound slightly offensive but most people we've got critical thinking skills right and i don't mean that in like a derogatory way no, but mean, most people who can kind of you know like are able to look at both sides of of things and kind of weigh things up and can be skeptical have kind of gone through a um like a kind of transformation in terms of the things that they believe in and i feel like there's quite it's weird like there's there's quite a lot of us who are like really into this topic finds it very very fascinating right. aren't necessarily like 
the like your stereotypical skeptic or a debunker or anything like that who have a certain level of belief but also are kind of like can see the nonsense for what it is yep yep and it's it's kind of got everything that i love there is like just there is a real surreal aspect to all this stuff just the stories and like how weird they can get Absolutely. But also there's just like, you know, the intrigue and the mystery and mm -hmm. the machinations of like uh, the political system and the military and intelligence right. agencies and like Got everything. Who doesn't <laughs> like a good spy story? You know, and I'm sorry, <laughs> it's really fascinating. But like you said, you do, I think, I mean, they're actually, I, I shouldn't say I think this is how it usually goes. For me, it went the more, because I still read a lot of UFO books and still read a lot about the paranormal. Oh, I'm, I'm still obsessive about it. But I do grow more skeptical of all the stories I loved as a kid growing up. Yeah. And especially, I think there's a tendency with a lot of people in the UFOs, especially to really focus and take the most legitimate cases to them are ones that come out of mi the military. And, oh, yeah. you know, Air Force pilots saw this. Look at this credentials. He right. Lie. And, and, and my whole feeling for a while now has been like, those are the stories. I mean, like, I'm interested in why they're saying it, but I yeah. do not think any of them are valid. Like, I think it's all yeah. fiction. I really do. Yeah. So I'm interested in, like, civilians' stories, like, normal people's stories. Like, I tend and to, like... there's so many. There's so many. So When you start digging into... Because I know you do a lot of, like local stuff around right. where you are but i i was um for a little bit last year and i kind of had a look today as well of like very local ufo sightings to me mm -hmm. especially in the 1970s and i was like taken aback at how many there were and then i started so to many. look into like my local history because i you know like especially with ufology always very american yeah. but just where i live um hugh dowding he lived about a mile and a half away. He was in, he's like a top Air Force guy, but he was also involved in like Adam the Adamski stuff. He was, I really? think he was an Adamski believer. He oh. also headed up, I think, um, the local like Flying Saucer Society. Um, he lives like a mile and a half away. Um, Alistair Crowley went to very briefly a school that's in my town. Um, there was Alice Bailey lived in one town over. I was like, there's so many of like these new age characters and like a George Adamski even came to the town, like one town over from me. Really? Like yeah. And then I started then I'm going off on a tangent. No, this here. is good. <laughs> but my, um, I started looking into like these um, local UFO sightings from the 1970s. And then when you start talking to people around you, they will start telling you about things that they've experienced. So it turns out, I think it was in like 1976, there was some somewhat of a mini flap like in my town. And my mum's friend saw one like, really? and he's like, she swears blindly that this happened. She even claims that it kind of like almost chased her home. Turns out my aunt saw one, as my great aunt saw one as well. Um, but everyone said that she was just drunk when she was walking home. She probably was <laughs> She probably was drunk, and I know. But <laughs> you'd have to be really drunk to hallucinate on that level. Right. I would feel like I would feel like drunk, and like when people say like they were on drugs, or they were drunk. Drunk. It's like I've I've done a couple drugs. I've drank a little bit. And <laughs> I've never hallucinated anything. No, I've never seen a UFO. Close. No, no. <laughs> absolutely not. And I was just take I was just taken aback by it because I then there was loads of these newspaper reports, and then apparently, um, and I got in contact with with them. Um, Bufora last year when I was trying to like validate all of this stuff because apparently Bufora bear in mind this is 1976 so their opinions have changed a lot now and when I told them about this they were like oh my god I can't believe someone would even say that but <laughs> apparently one of their investigators came to the town and said that we were on a ley line so oh. that was <laughs> that, that's what, there you go <laughs> <laughs> UFOs. It couldn't possibly be that there was some sort of military thing about 30, 40 minutes away from here. That probably mm. wasn't anything to do with it whatsoever. No. No, that's Definitely the ley line. <laughs> ley line is way sexier. Let's just go with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> but you do a lot of those like local like local research local stories i do i do as much as i can you know i moved uh i'm originally from omaha nebraska where i am now and i lived in la you know then i went to college away from nebraska 
at the University of Kansas. And then I moved to LA and lived there for mm -hmm. 20 years. And then during the pandemic, I moved back here to be closer to my parents because they're getting older and I started freaking out. Uh, but when I got back here, I was like, well, this would be a nice little microcosm to kind of like try to collect as many weird stories as I could. And, you know, when you go on Google and stuff like that, you can only find, I mean, there, there's stuff, you know, UFO sightings and Bigfoot and ghost yeah. stories and stuff. But it, after a while, it starts to peter out. And you're like, no, oh, there's not that much. But then I started talking to historians in small towns and local librarians. And I was uncovering quite a bit of things, like, by actually just talking to people yeah. and, and also using newspapers.com to go into, like, you my know, favorite old, website you, probably every, my most visited agreed. website yeah yeah i'm on it all the time i'll just like keyword search wild man 1890s you know <laughs> like <laughs> i mean that's what i do for fun <laughs> you know but uh yeah it is such a unbelievable it's an unthinkably great resource especially for mm. how cheap it is you know it's oh yeah so yeah. cheap and it's really great but you can find so much stuff if you're willing to be patient mm -hmm. and you get good at using the keyword you know uh search but yeah, w w when I came back here, I just started to discover all these old stories. And then I started like thinking to myself, like, these are all going to go away. Because a lot of these people who have these stories, and I look at it all as like collecting folklore. Mm -hmm. I can't prove, there's not any of these cases where I'm like, oh, no, man, this seems like it's true. But I'm not even concerned about that. I'm just concerned about preserving these the stories. And the, the history and the folklore, because I do feel like it's super important to culture and small town culture and absolutely just kind we of were, more the area we were having this conversation um when i was on your podcast about um towns like point pleasant yeah right that are like whether or not you believe in the mothman story is like it, no, neither here nor there right. it's like done it's kind of like brought back this um small town and, and you know they've got a lot of tourism that revolves around it and the way that they've done it is like really like i i, I mean when i went to visit there i thought it was great uh -huh. like an amazing museum with like loads of stuff in it loads of like interesting newspaper clippings they've got all the stuff from the movie which i don't like i don't like the movie i hear you me either <laughs> yeah <laughs> they, but it's they, kind they of didn't cover this, like, the good stuff <laughs> yeah it's but it's got this like really nice kind of like small town feel to it and then there's also like the flatwoods museum as yes. well which is just up the road an hour and it's away like, yeah yeah and it's just like there's so many like strange stories and i think like that's where i i don't know th those are like the things that interest me about like paranormal stuff and and ufology is like these kind of like very small stories that don't kind of turn into these kind of you know like the Lou Elizondo type ufology and stuff like that like what? I'm much more interested it is it like as much as I'm interested in that yeah. and I'm interested in you know like all of the decades of nonsense I think like the real like fun stuff the things that are actually enjoyable are just like you know man has a sighting on the road you know and that, yeah you kind of <laughs> nailed my sentiment exactly I I feel like I, I've kind of described how I'm into UFOs. I'm into like folksy UFOs, mm. like small town, like a, a saucer lands on a farmer's field and like a weird, like, you know, seven legged, like humanoid, like walks off that <laughs> weird, surreal. Like I, I like, I, oh, and I kind of use this as an example. Like I'm, I, you know, I work in media, so I use a lot of media examples, but I feel like there's people in like, I'm not putting down the X-Files, but there are people who are into UFOs in a very X-Files way. Yes. And then, then there are people who are into UFOs in a Twin Peaks way. And I'm, I'm, yes. the Twin Peaks way for me is, is like the path. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm interested in the surrealism like and the eternity. I feel like I'm a, I'm definitely a mix of both. I feel like um I've had to take like a little bit of a break from from like UFO research for the past like maybe like a week or so, and I'm planning to step away from it for a couple more weeks because it does actually drive you insane. Like for this sure. time. I, don't, I think it was about this time last year where I said, oh, I'm going to start researching and putting together a video on MJ-12. Well, it's a year later. That video still doesn't exist. But I, I, I am not kidding when I say that I've, like, been researching that for months. I mean, we're talking the best part of a year wow. of, of, like, researching. and But I still... Because it's a um, what's the term? Wilderness of mirrors. Yeah. It's just a nightmare. But it's designed purposefully to be like that. 
It is, but what I will say is even just, you know, you and I were having a conversation this afternoon and you messaged me, you know, a piece of information about it that, you know, relating to MJ-12, you know, anything with Bill Moore and Jamie Shander, Shandere, you know, yeah. Shandera, whatever, I think is related to MJ-12, right? But mm -hmm. like that new little piece of information you gave me was kind of big. So it's like, yes, <laughs> you're still uncovering stuff that is new to the whole yeah. MJ-12 saga, which well, if somebody might have found it before, but it, I, I haven't seen it anywhere. I for, to give a to give a bit of background for people that don't know, Bill Moore, UFO researcher from 19, late nineteen seventies into the eighties, um, wrote several books with Charles Belitz, Roswell incident. Um, that book essentially popularized um, the the Roswell incident, made it kind of the more more of a phenomena. Um, also the Philadelphia experiment. Oh yeah, and um, he throughout the eighties was involved in uh, disinformation, intelligence game, whatever you want to call it. Um, with with Rick Doty targeting ufologists, he had been giving disinformation to ufologists, self admitted, um, and. Out of that operation, a whole slew of documents came out. They're called the Majestic 12 documents. They're most likely fakes. Um, well, they are a they lot are. of the majority <laughs> yeah, of them are fakes. So, yeah. There's a couple on, on that Majestic 12 documents website that are legit. Um, it was most likely um, a cover for um, some sort of like uh conflict conf planned like a planned conflict between the united states and um soviet union it was like war plans i think was um what majestic 12 actually was um and again the timing of it is important 80s cold war um all of that kind of stuff going on and yeah got, goes a little crazy <laughs> and those <laughs> those um those documents um they basically they detail that so you're uh i'm trying to i'm trying to give like a i'm trying to explain this in a way that somebody that's never heard of this how they could pick it up but basically like everything from the x files right so you know the idea of an extraterrestrial biological entity i think even the group majestic group is mentioned in that that all comes out of this disinformation campaign involving brick doty bill moore bunch of other people probably involving the cia um probably involving people like um harry rizitsky um and others so th there was a there was a lot going on there it's a very um <laughs> that was that was a, that was a good that was a good paraphrase thumbnail of i would not have been able to do that <laughs> but today i found because because me and steve have a have a very a mutual obsession which is missing ufologists. So people that kind of come into the world of ufology, make their mark and then disappear as if they've never existed. Um, and Bill Moore is absolutely one of those people. He still, you know, he hasn't disappeared off the face of the earth. More, I mean, more kind of like disappeared in the world of ufology. Is no longer, you know, kind of like actively involved. Um, and uh, today when I was looking around on newspapers.com, because I kind of thought like, and, and another guy that's involved in this, it's a guy called Jamie Chanderay, was a friend of Bill Moore. Jamie Chanderay received some of these fake documents in the mail in 1984. Or at least that's the story. And um, I was just looking up about Jamie Chanderay because he's another, or Jamie Chandera. Um, he's another one of these ufologists that was kind of like very, very much like active and around in the 80s, but kind of drops off the face of the earth in the 90s. And in 1996, um, he apparently was publishing a book with Will, uh, Bill Moore. Sorry, I was going to say, I was gonna say Will Moore. <laughs> it's, it's, it's William Moore, but it's Bill Moore. Um, called Exempt from Disclosure in 1996. However, that never came out as far as I know. But about 10 years later, a book called Exempt from Disclosure came out, which was written by uh, Robert Collins and Rick Doty, who was involved in the disinformation campaign. So it's it's all gone a little bit crazy. And now that's this is this is it. So Majestic was the name of the 1952 plan for war against the USSR, one of mm. the few privy to it 
was Harry Rosicki, later known as Falcon. So that's this whole idea of like the aviary, right? So Bill Moore had this group of people um, that were given bird names, right? So they were all kind of like people involved in like military intelligence. Um, and he kind of gave them nicknames, uh, bird nicknames. He had like Falcon, um, Raven. What was Doty? Uh, yo, boy. I can't remember which one he was now. I know it wasn't Colonel John was Alexander, it? like the penguin or something. Uh, I can't remember the... <laughs> gosh. I should have these memorized by now, you know. <laughs> <laughs> to memorize it. But the one thing but about Rosinski all... you were saying is that he was the last one to be discovered, like and confirmed. And I feel like that only was confirmed like five years ago. And I can't I, I William Moore. Yeah. So uh, again, I just I, I I just don't know how much of any of this that I believe in. I, I believe in this. Mm -hmm. Because you can actually verify this, that it was the name of a 1952 plan for war. But you, there's so much of it that you can't actually verify. Yeah. Uh, obviously. Um, which is know, uh, which is the case for um, all this stuff <laughs> that comes yeah. out of like anything that comes, you know, yeah, kind of from exactly. official sources. It's all, exactly. first off, it's wild, wild stories that absolutely yeah. cannot be verified. Yeah. You know, it, we're still we're still waiting crazy. for uh, you know David Grush was going to do it for us, obviously. But uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely was. That's why I had to take I had to take I've had to take a break from it for a couple of weeks. Yeah. This is literally just driving myself insane, and I can't get to a point where I can where I feel confident in any hypothesis about it. Yeah. So that I, that's why I'm I'm just like. Uh, so actually, we're talking about missing ufologists i kind of understand how some of them go missing you know because this stuff is designed to drive you absolutely insane and that is kind of if i had to like make the most logical guess or what is logical to me is that like a guy like bill moore or uh you know jimmy shander or even like albert k bender you know going mm -hmm. way back in the day or even our mm -hmm. victorian henry mm -hmm. azadel who we're going to talk about mm -hmm. a little later mm -hmm. It might they might just hit a point where like this is like disruptive to my life and I'm about <laughs> ready to lose my mind and I'm gonna just like <laughs> grasp on to the last bit of sanity I have and step away, you know? Like and that might be the case. I feel like that's the most logical explanation, but you know, there's always room to speculate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I just yeah, I, I, and it's all just disinformation games, right? Mm -hmm. And that's um that uh, yeah. And again, like there's so much of it, I guess, because I, I'm, I very much want to like before having like a, um, I don't know, I even said this on like, I, I, cause I was re-listening to the podcast that we did together to think mm -hmm. about what we were, what we were talking about on there. And there was even a bit on there where I, where I sound so nervous to even give an opinion, like a vibes based opinion on something, if I haven't got any evidence to back it up. But the problem with all of this stuff is that there isn't any evidence to back it all up. And if there is evidence, it's going to be destroyed or it's going to be like covered up in some way because it's all to do with like, yeah, intelligence agencies, the military. Right. You know. And then you even have to say, like, even when you get like something that seems like evidence, you're like, is this even valid evidence or is this fake? Yeah. You know, like it, yeah. it's really, like you said earlier, it's a wilderness of mirrors. Like you just yeah. will never get to the actual bottom of it. I don't think. Maybe, you know, maybe yeah. there is a way, but I think, I think in like, a, a, in like maybe a couple of decades. I, I don't think that the truth will be, will be like obscured forever, right? right when it right. comes to these kind of things, um, but it, yeah. And again, we were talking about this on on your podcast. It's like a lot of these archives as well are are very kind of like hush hush. Yeah. So like Jacques Vallée's archives are kind of like under lock and key until a certain time. Right. Um, Leo, uh, what's his name? Why can't I remember it? Leo Sprinkle. Leo Sprinkle. Sprinkle's archives are like not available until like 2070 for some of yeah. them. Yeah. 2070, which is like, okay, whatever. Like there's going to be yeah. a, people around in 2070. Right. <laughs> I mean, we're talking like 50 years from now. I'm like, bloody, am I going to have to go out to Wyoming as an 84, 84 year old? Oh, we finally hell. got it. Now I can die. <laughs> <laughs> no you're right i mean like i know i think like with valets he's got like a 10-year truth embargo or something and i don't know if that's the right Some, word something to like use. That. Uh, yeah but like it's all at rice university i think that's the same yeah. way 
how he releases his forbidden science uh books which i really love they're like you know his like diaries and i think there's five volumes now but he those waits. diaries are like there's a lot there's in so there so much stuff in there if you just do if you can if you get like pdfs or ebooks of them and you can just do a keyword search my god like any anything that you're looking for you'll probably find it. there's you'll a find mention of it interesting yeah in there yeah i mean especially if you're interested in this particular kind of stuff we're talking about yes i don't know if there's books out there that are more valuable and to doing yeah. research on the stuff than those. I mean, yeah. there is, you know, he was just, especially like in the, you know, 70s, 80s, and 90s, he was just running around with a lot of these key players, like the people you hear over and over again, still to this day, Hal Putoff, Kit Green, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, they're, they're wild yeah. books. Yeah, all the people that kind of circulate around around this subject. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming this is, this is Tenny, says uh, Valet's aviary name is was supposed to be parrot. Oh, the one box. <laughs> <laughs> that checks out. <laughs> so great. going back to your um kind of interest in more local code, because I again this conversation is going to be all over the place. Good. But if you're watching it back, there there will be timestamps. If you're watching it live, you're just going to have to put up with it. <laughs> But going back to your interest in like local cases, you were on Erica Luke's show about four weeks ago, and you mentioned that you were going to investigate a local Bigfoot case. Yeah, that yeah. sounded very fascinating. Oh. And I know that you have since done yeah. a little bit of investigation. Yeah, I, it's it's I'm in I'm in the middle of it. So I this is like you know this is like a John Keel dream for me. So <laughs> a, you know. Gosh, I, I can't remember when exactly. Well, it's not that long ago, like you said. Uh, I was made aware that in this little town about 40-ish minutes away from Omaha, where I live, like right along the, the Missouri River, there has, the police were investigating three separate Bigfoot reports. And I'm like, what? And so I get in contact with this lady who is kind of... You know, she's a local researcher in Nebraska, and she told me, she's like, yeah, I I know where one of the locations is. And I'm like, where is it? And she told me. And so my friend and I, we, we drove out there to, in, first off, this was kind of like in an urban area. It's a mm -hmm. small little town next to a river, so it's not like a city by any means. Right. But this it was like along the main drag of the little town. And I can't mention the store because I promised them I wouldn't because they don't want people coming there. So, whatever. But it is like yeah, so that's that's a bad business decision. First of all, you should get people coming there. That's this is to go through the roof. People I go crazy could not agree this. more. I, they're missing a huge opportunity. I, <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not great business. But um, <laughs> I went there and just like a weirdo, kind of like walked in the store, and I, I'm like went up to these two ladies who were stocking shelves. And I was like, uh, you know, good afternoon, la ladies. Uh, by any chance, have you heard about the uh, Bigfoot sighting that uh, transpired here uh, not too long ago? And one lady stepped forward and she's like, I'm the one who reported it. I'm the one who saw it. And I was like, oh, wow. oh my God. Like, you know, I got like a stomach ache. I was like, almost, because I've never really like been on a fresh case like this. And uh, <laughs> then the store owner actually came out and she did not look happy that this lady started talking to me. And I was asking her about it. And she tells me about the story. And the story was, she was closing up the store at night and she was at the front door, like making sure it was locked or whatever. And then she looks around the corner and a like eight foot tall, big foot, you know, covered in reddish fur is like playing peekaboo with her around the corner of the store. <laughs> and, um, I, which I think is fantastic. And though she was terrified, you know, I, mean, I feel bad for her cause she definitely seemed like when, even when I talked to her, like she was like kind of traumatized by this little, a little bit. And she went back in the store, like locked the doors and called the police. And then the police came and like cleared the area, said, you know, and like looked around. But then I guess five blocks away from there, there was another report. And then there was one. What year was this? This year. This year? Oh, yeah. Well, actually in 2023. So. Okay. Right. Yeah. It, it was. But very uh, recent. Yeah. Just like a few months ago. And it's still supposedly like kind of ongoing. Supposedly there was another setting kind of recently right down by the river and like, right. which is just like a quarter mile away from where these, you know, other reports were. So I'm, uh, you know, I've been going out there with my, and like, look, 
I, I can't, I'm not like going out there thinking like I'm going to see Bigfoot or these people genuinely saw Bigfoot. I don't know, but uh, maybe they did, <laughs> you know, but the thing is, I love the story. And so part of, you know, being a person who is like in love with documenting the stuff in his home mm -hmm. state, this was super, it's super exciting for me. And so I'm like, you know, trying to get a hold of Union Pacific, which is like the big train um, company that kind of, you know, does importing and exporting of goods all over the country. It's the biggest right. uh, train organization. That's not, or that's not how, how you say it. Anyway, I'm you trying. Mean, yeah, you, you know what I mean? Uh, so I'm trying to get a hold of them. And then I put an email into uh, someone at the Blair Police Department right. to try to verify if they actually are, you know, investigating this stuff. So I'm, it's kind of one of these things where I, I'm putting out like inquiries and then I have to wait until I get a response. But it is it, it has just been a great distraction from my life. <laughs> it's so much fun. I've, so I'm there were three, three sightings very close to, did they hit the? Very close. Like, how close, like in what? terms of days? Oh, uh, like that, I don't know for certain. I know, I think the way the lady who saw this made it seem like it was all like in a very short time period. Right. But I don't know if it was like, you know, a day or two days or anything like and that. And how did you come to hear about it? So I, funny enough, there is a big a Nebraska Bigfoot researchers like Facebook group. Nice. That, Love that, that. Is, <laughs> that like I, that I will like go in on every once in a while and try to like plug people, like trying to get a conversation started. And it's the, it's really the reason I got back on Facebook was for, for this group when I moved. Oh, back. I'm in so many different groups like this, but I've got like a I've I have like a fake Facebook profile. I don't use yeah. my own name, but I'm in like um uh Kent, which is the county in which I live. Uh, Kent Big Cat sightings because you have like a loads of loads of big cat stuff around here. Ooh, we got our big yeah. cats here too. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> I love an ABC, an alien black cat, or an Upa. <laughs> Out of place animal, whatever you, however you want to phrase it, <laughs> your choice. Uh, yeah, there's lots of that around here. Um, oh, that's, yeah. that's yeah. Well, the UK does have a like a long history of Black Panther settings. Massive, massive yeah. loads that are local to me. Yeah, I think Nick Redfern used to write about that back in the I day. Think, yeah, I think so. I think so. And 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 it's very like I. I don't think that people are like making these up at all. Like, I, it's very obvious to me that like at some point these were kept as exotic pets. Right. They've then been let out and a few of them survive in the wild, yeah. right? Yeah. And it's like, I'm very um, on the fence about Bigfoot stuff, mm -hmm. right? I don't disbelieve, but I don't necessarily believe Same. either. Same. Um, so I'm very on the fence about it. But it's one of those things that I'm like, I, I don't necessarily care for people that go out and debunk it because it's like, who's, who are you hurting? Who's yeah. who's being hurt by believing in Bigfoot? You know? Right. Like right. it doesn't that kind of stuff does the only time that I'm interested in like a kind of, you know, like kind of picking apart stuff like that is when there, there's like active harm being done. Um, so mm -hmm. you know, like when it comes to Bigfoot, that's stuff I want to believe in. You know, yeah, I know I what you believe mean. that there's the eight man walking around, you know, it's, eight, it's eight foot fantastic. tall, whatever. Well, I grew it, up watching Harry and the Hendersons, you know, this movie. is a vibe. If you don't, I mean, I still cry when I, I love that movie and it, it makes me like, it like wrecks movie. me for like two days because I, I, mm. when John Lithgow slaps him saying, can't you see we don't watch around here anymore? Like yeah. that messes <laughs> me up, man. Like I'm going to start crying right now. Uh, <laughs> but that is actually one thing that like Bigfoot is a lot more fun in a lot of ways than UFOs because UFOs are so messed up in the whole like, you know, military industrial complex which gives right. it and that's like when you know like a lot of the work you do and i think like you know erica luce and jack brewer do because like ufos are are harmful in ways yeah. you know what i mean like i mean there's been cults started by you know like i feel like people people should read valet's book messengers of deception you know oh, yeah. that, that's a very important book to like know about well, right you, now. A, lot of, a lot of a lot of ufology is born out of cults so like Absolutely. things like guy and edna ballard and the i am yeah um, like the i am activity and all of the links back to theosophy a lot of it comes out of not to say that theosophy is a cult i don't think that's a very fair um uh description of it um but what i mean is like kind of 
Elena Blavatsky kind of comes, a lot of these teachings then get kind of like twisted, yeah. turned into ascended master teachings, mm -hmm. um, which then become cults, which then um, have a very big inspiration on very early youthology and um, especially contactees. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they were really lifting a lot of what theosophy had to say. Yeah. I mean, it didn't. Maybe it was George Van Tassel, but didn't Adamski have some sort of connection to theosophy? Or was it? Oh, he, yeah. Like, he had some. Um, right? He was, I, I'm not sure if he was like a, um, I'm, I can't say 100% certain whether or not he was a theosophist. He was absolutely connected to to different like esoteric right. um, groups, uh, like very familiar. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want to like put my foot in my mouth and say that he was a theosophist, but he was yeah. definitely you know, like very interested in spiritualism. Um, right. And his, he had, I'm fairly certain he had something in like, wasn't it called like Palomar Gardens or something like that? He had like a, I really want to remember what it's called. I'm, do you know what? I'm going to have well, to Google it. Yeah, well, he, wor he worked by a Palomar, Matt Palomar. Wasn't he like a janitor? He or had like his own like, he had his own religious, um, hang on a second, Royal Order of Tibet. That's what I was thinking of. Interesting. Um, he founded the Royal Order of Tibet in Laguna Beach, which held its meetings in the Temple of Scientific Philosophy. I mean, yeah, I've got no, I, yeah. He, in the 1920s, he's became interested in the esoteric occultist religion, theosophy, and a variant called neo-theosophy. By the 1930s, um, he was a minor figure in the California occult scene, teaching his personal mixture of Christianity and Eastern religions, which he called universal progressive Christianity and universal law. Right. Yeah. So yeah, he was. I mean, it, it, yeah, <laughs> and, uh, even like experience. even Meat Lane, who you know, I think started oh, yeah. Borderland Sciences. You know, he mm. was heavily influenced by theosophy. Again, yeah. I don't know if he was a theosophist, but like, yeah, it's too coincidental that these these things were coming out or you know so close together. I think I think theosophy like really like was the beginning of the you know Abs oh, America's new age movement. A hundred percent. And and then Guy Ballard coming in and kind of like really uh, like turning this idea that Blavatsky had of like, I don't know how we've gone from Bigfoot to Blavatsky, <laughs> but my God, we're doing it. Um, <laughs> this idea that Blavatsky has of like her Mahatmas, right, who she right. always said were flesh and blood. They right. were um, they were just kind of like, you know, they're spiritual teachers, but they're not like angels or anything. They are, um, they're like, uh, just like kind of like wise guides, right? Even though I think, I do think there was some kind of like, they they lived longer than everybody else. But then Guy Ballard and Guy and Edna Ballard come in in the 1930s and they um, take this idea of like the Mahatmas, um, these like masters, and they turn them into ascended masters. So they become this kind of, um, they're, they're not, you know, uh, Although they appear in like flesh and blood, they're also like they're not they're not the way that Blavatsky um explained them to be. Mm -hmm. And then it gets then it gets really then it all gets really bizarre because it brings in a lot more like Saint Germain becomes this big, the big spiritual figure. And there's a lot of like stuff to do with like Venus and um like we like very like weird kind of like um things that you can compare to like uh the very early contacty like meetings with aliens because mm -hmm. like guy ballard meets saint germain on mount shasta and he like appears in a contacty like experience but then i guess i guess that's you know it's very similar to like many religious experiences right, right. but there's all there's like a lot of weird tie-ins and one of the weirdest tie-ins i always found with like the guy ballard thing is when when he met guy ballard on this mount on mount shasta um uh, when sorry, when <laughs> I messed it up, when Guy Ballard met Saint Germain on Mount Shasta, Saint Germain gives him a chalice, and inside it is like a creamy white liquid. And in one of Whitley Strieber's books, I think it's maybe called like The Key, and oh. it's the one where he's like in the hotel room with the guy. Yeah, the guy visits him in the right? hotel. Yeah, but yeah. doesn't the guy give him like a cup of cream or something? 
it really i there was something I about it that was like there was some very weird resonances because when i heard about that i was like well it just sounds just like friggin guy ballard i am stuff yeah it sounds like a lot of like fairy stories too like here's some cream yeah. here's a little piece of bread come into the other world Yes, exactly. <laughs> I should put. I, yeah, I probably need to go like way back further because I I know that these stories go back like way way further. There's just so much to like read and there is. There's not enough time. And how they like evolve over time. Yep. Like yep. yeah, I should go back and read Passport to Magonia. That that'll <laughs> that'll be a good primer into it for sure. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's where I heard about all the stuff with like the fairy yeah. culture being you know so similar yeah. to the UFO experience and. I mean, he's not wrong. That's I feel like the comparison yeah. is pretty good. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So let's get back to the Bigfoot story. I don't know how we went to Blavatsky. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, 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 when we talk about Bigfoot, you always end up at Blavatsky, I think. You yeah, know? you like, do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Bigfoot, Blavatsky, same yeah, thing, really. Yeah. Um, so what's your what's your like what's your take on Bigfoot? Where do you stand? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, ugh, it's like one of these things where I don't know. Like, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not when I have a hard time like operating on the idea of like faith. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a religious person at all, and so the idea of just like kind of like saying I believe in this thing, even though I have no evidence or no proof, and I have not experienced it myself. Mm -hmm. However, I've actually been lucky enough in the last like two couple of years to speak with a couple of people who say they have witnessed things and it's been I've a couple of people i've had to really work work hard to get them to talk to me mm -hmm. and they don't want any like notoriety any fame and a lot of times like please don't use my name this story is for you not it's not to share and when i guess it's just maybe my naivete but like when sometimes these people i swear i feel like they believe what they're experiencing like they really Absolutely. believe they thought they like this lady i met you know in blair nebraska just a couple weeks ago my friend and i who were there we walked out and i'm like what do you think i'm like he's like what do you think i feel like i th i'm pretty sure she believes what she saw and he's like i feel that too now it could be like you know uh totally mistaken for a human it was dark out it was at night you know someone with long yeah. hair and a beard it could have been that a for bear. sure a bear we don't have bears here but that yeah. would make it would probably would make more logical sense that a bear somehow got to Nebraska and like yeah. was standing up and playing peekaboo, you mm -hmm. know. But I think with a lot of this stuff, I tend to not all the stories and definitely not ones that come out of the military. I really don't believe those, any <laughs> of those to be honest. And I, I probably shouldn't make such a sweeping com comment like that because you know maybe there's an F-14 pilot's you know personal story that is genuine, but I just kind of don't take those seriously. I suppose. Yeah, well, I think it's good, especially given all of the stories over the years, to treat those those stories with a bit more skepticism. Yeah, I think yeah, I exactly. think it's um deserved. Right, and I feel like a lot of people's rationale is like, well, why would they lie? Why would an F fourteen? I mean, because he was told to lie. It's yeah, exactly. <laughs> simple as that. Or yeah. he was shown something as a test. Yes. Which I think could be, that makes a lot of sense to me, you know, just like strategically from a militaristic standpoint, it's like, well, you would want to test your hardware out on professional people who know what they're seeing. If yeah. we can trick them, then we can trick civilians. And if we can trick, you know, I, you know, I don't know. Like, there's plenty of rationales for that. But yeah, some of these stories that I, I hear about just from like, even people I know, friends who I know, you know, it's like they've experienced some dramatic things and i just am pretty sure they're not lying to me i don't and again this, i don't know but like you know yeah like, and this is an interesting comment as well from donald she says hi strangeness is exactly what it is i believe first-hand accounts more than i do photographs or video never gonna catch anything like that on camera by accident now this is where i feel like i diverge from the wider skeptic community i even saw something on twitter the other day where somebody said um said uh uh, if people are getting up abducted, why can't they just take a photograph right. if they're getting abducted by aliens? I'm like, right. first of all, it's like you're, there's a kind of, how do I phrase this? I feel like skeptics come at this. And when I, when I use the word skeptics in this sense, I'm using you know, like skeptics TM, right? Yeah. You know, like your typical skeptic. Yeah, like a Michael they come at it, Which 
I never want to be associated with that man as some. You're of not. No. Yeah, that's not your vibe at all. <laughs> views. I agree. Yeah. I denounce that man. Mm -hmm. That man's ruined the word skepticism for me. Yeah, he, <laughs> he has though. I mean, oh, I, 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 just, I agree. And they're yeah. so dogmatic. They're yeah, so they dogmatic, are. but they won't say that they're dogmatic. But they are. They'll be like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're just, we're just, we're just skeptics. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very like, and I, and I had this kind of issue last week when the arrow report came out because it was a lot of people that were like um oh ufology's over now believe this the government have said this so therefore it's over it's like i mean i don't know about anybody else maybe i'm maybe i'm too conspiracy minded but i tend generally when the government are investigating themselves i tend to think mm, we're not really going to get anywhere. That's no. not to say that I think that they're hiding re like reversed engineered craft. I absolutely don't believe that. I think there was parts of that report that were interesting. I don't, anyway, I'm going off on a bit of a tangent, but like the skepticism doesn't really approach the, those kind of skeptics. I sound, I sound like trying to like distance myself from, right. I'm going all over the place. You know, but those kind of skeptics don't, they, their skepticism only goes so far, right? right. So their skepticism is um, towards um, random person that's, they, that has had a bizarre incident and they want to pick it apart and say that absolutely didn't happen. Right. Instead of using that skeptical mind to go, okay, if this per what this person's saying is true, but I don't necessarily believe in aliens or been abducted by a, a bigfoot or whatever what else could this experience be right. what like and and using those kind of like skeptical skills i feel like a lot of the time like skepticism is used to like tear people down and i know that i've been guilty of doing that in the past um like being, we all have um, though you know like yeah you know I mean, some stuff is just all bollocks. Like it, it is. It is. I'm sorry. Like, it's okay to tear down David Wilcox. You know, like, it, it you know, <laughs> oh, because absolutely. he's doing harmful things to people. Yes, I, mean, exactly. he, I think he is putting out really, like, negative information and tricking yes. very, like, like, I feel people who I feel very sorry for and yes. literally like, grifting money in, like, you know, so, like, those kinds of people. I think like need to be taken down and, and definitely my job is not to like clean up ufology, this. you know what I'm yeah. saying? But um, the whole thing is with like with UFOs, like even if there is like not an external phenomenon, like it's not a separate intelligence or whatever, if, even if it's like an internal phenomenon or like a mass hallucination that people have been experiencing for hundreds or thousands of years, that is just as interesting to me. Yes, because that is absolutely. really weird if that's the case. And so I love weirdness and surrealism and absurdism. So no matter what the thing is with UFOs, if there's something genuine about it or it's not exactly real in a sense of like it's a material thing. Exactly. Either way, it's interesting. No matter how you slice it. And, and like, you know, like I think you, I'm interested in all like UFO ephemera. I love the way flying saucers look i love the way it feels mm -hmm. i love going to a ufo conference and going to the room where they're selling all the books i've never, and been, to one. I've never oh. been to a ufo conference i'm going to a bigfoot conference though, oh June. fun good mm -hmm. yeah it's i mean like look i love going to this stuff i love mm -hmm. watching speakers you know lecture i i lo i love every part of it and there is a lot of negative stuff and i just try not to truck in that area too much yeah, I am fascinated by the machinations of disinformation and how UFO, UFO phenomenon has been used to deceive people and probably pump up money for the military. <laughs> you know, and this is the, this this sums it up exactly because it sums up a bit of what I was trying to say. Skeptics never allow for the possibility of intelligence operations against Americans, so they don't. Yeah, they they kind of just write everything off. Everyone must be a hoaxer everyone must be trying to get in on some kind of grift and while i think that there are absolutely hoaxes and there are absolutely people that are trying to For um sure. you know be um you know making money from this kind of stuff i think there are genuine people that are um that are uh yeah that have um experiences yeah well yeah. i think it's i think it's almost like a normal thing to be curious about you know like i think uh i I believe, that, and I, I don't want to butcher the quote, but Mark Pilkington was on uh, Erica's show. Erica, uh, and I think maybe it was UFO Classifieds at the time. And it was a great interview. He's always a great person to listen to. But he said, 
And he, I don't think he was saying, yes, I believe in like the paranormal, but he was saying like, I believe that weird shit happens to people. Yes. And I thought that was such a great way to put it. And he wasn't yeah. saying that means there's something external. He was just saying like people experience weird stuff and it's very real for them. And Absolutely. If, if that is it, that is so deeply interesting to me. Yeah. It's like, why, why do we experience weird shit? Is it just like a misfiring exactly. of brain synapses and we all kind of start seeing the same ish thing because of like, you know, the archetypes we pull from, from our subconscious. I know that sounds really woo woo and weird, but no, but it's, you know, yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, it is. I, yeah, that's, that's the thing. I'm, I'm very like open to, to, to weird stuff. Um, but I'm also, uh, yeah, like skeptical. And I, th I guess like, even in what we were saying earlier about like the, the kind of like, man sees ufo from car or has you know the, you know small town sightings even though sometimes can sadly be wrapped up in oh, yeah. these wider um you know disinformation operations yep. you know people yep. people that think that they've they've seen a certain thing but they've actually seen you know like top secret military craft the whole um hypothesis that a lot of alien abductees have actually been um victims of mind control experiments for uh -huh. example abducted by the military yeah um so you know there's a lot of different um hypotheses out there yeah i mean i mean you know i know you are uh friendly with martin cannon and i have not read the controllers because it's a hard book to find but you you know i'm going to do, download the pdf like you recommended which mm -hmm. i don't know why i didn't think about think of that but did he kind of hypothesize kind of a my labs like yes yeah, so i won't because I, I, I know that he's watching and i know that uh, he's not not a oh I don't, I, I don't we'll talk about words. it okay yeah. i don't but i don't want to put words in his mouth but i know maybe his opinions have changed slightly maybe that he would he would rework it a little bit but yes like that was right. um and, and i still think that the controllers is definitely a worthwhile worthwhile read yeah i'm um, gonna read it he's got some great research um I don't know whether he would like me talking about it. So right, right, right. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I'm like, oh, God, what should okay. I say? I, I like it. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I think that um, that it's, even if you don't um, believe in all of it, it's definitely a, um, a, a, a very interesting hypothesis that to me is a lot more believable than um, the John Lear um, hypothesis. So... You yeah. don't think that a great aliens are coming down to capture our soul to put them in a soul catcher I on the moon? Do. Oh, no, I don't. Actually. Really? I, don't I mean, John Leary. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> Surprisingly not. Yeah, I don't. I don't necessarily believe in that. <laughs> well, you know, the, by the end of this, well, I'll have you convinced. You know, <laughs> everything Lear said was on the level. For sure. Oh, good lord! You know, someone I used to know actually went to his house. Um, she was a uh, she. Um. God, I knew her years ago. She used to host a uh, kind of conspiracy paranormal show in the UK. And um, I can't even remember where I met her. I, m I met her through like, uh, I was a bit more involved in like, you know, like political circles and stuff right, like that when right. I was younger. I think I met her through that. And um, she was on a uh, TV show um, about, uh aliens she had had her own experience um and they kind of like took a more basically the or this debunking tv show to take a bunch of people that claim to have experienced stuff and debunk them and make them look like idiots basically but Aww. they ended up at john lear's house my god that guy like what what a, what a house he had like that office yeah yeah, was, I mean, I'm kind of jealous of that. I mean, the office had like you know ten thousand old like dusty VHS tapes, oh, books, yeah. files, FOIA boxes. You know, like <laughs> yeah. I mean, he was a fascinating character. Like you know, I, I've I guess I've been in this stuff long enough where I used to like, you know, you know, there was a website that was really popular kind of before social media called Above Top Secret. Oh yeah, mm, right. Yeah. Sure, and, and I'm sure people Very know about that. With that. <laughs> but I used to like religiously read the UFO. Just I was really just there for the UFO stuff. Uh, yeah, not necessarily like the other 
garbage. <laughs> I mean, there's a oh, lot I'm, of garbage on that site. Oh, boy. I was about about 15 years ago. I was there for all of it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, be careful in there. It, but I haven't <laughs> yeah, looked at it for a long anyway. time. <laughs> I don't even know if it's still there. But um, it used to be it, not to stop you. But I no. feel like I don't know whether you would agree with this, but the landscape feels very different now than it did because it, as i was kind of like growing up post 9 11 the conspiracy world and the world of the paranormal and all of that kind of stuff they've always kind of been there's always been like an overlap but oh, yeah, it never felt sure. as like it never felt as sinister as it does now and i'm sure maybe that's just like rose tinted glasses and now i'm more mature but yeah. like but i don't know, i can't remember it feeling like as awful as it is now yeah i it, it's hard for me to say because kind of like you i felt like i'm a, a bit older than you but i don't really i wasn't like in the mix you know back mm -hmm. in the 90s in the early 2000s but then se. i say that and then it's like you know i i, I think that's maybe like rose tinted glasses because yeah. you know like the 90s had all of the militia movements you had, the creepy, you had people like that so i think i was it's just probably... gonna say I think I think we're just more aware of it now mm -hmm. and I think also you get to a point where especially like when you start to take these topics and instead of like just looking at them as like paranormal or conspiracy you open it up to kind of take in more of like the context around you exactly you start to have a lot a much clearer view as, right. like especially with me of like UFOs like as soon as I started to get more into like the parapolitical side of stuff I just was like Oh bloody hell! This is all a psyop. This is yeah. all just giant disinformation, military nonsense. Like, what yeah. have I been believing in for such a long time? I know, I know, and like, I love for, you know, I have a love of like the UFO, like uh, as a as a whole, and it, mm -hmm. it is unfortunate is that there is so much like just filth, like you know, yeah. and also like it's undeniable that there is just a hard. And I don't know. Well, I mean, if you actually go back to the contactees thing, there was so much relationship between the silver shirts and literal like Nazi, you know, sympathizers. Were I, I, yeah, mixed that, up that, in this stuff. So it's I like, am came out of that as well. They were it, they were directly linked to William Dudley Pelly in the silver shirts. Yeah, the uh, some of the members of I am like their head uh, people. They were they were part of. Um, and another organization it was like hang on i'll get the name because i was writing this and i was doing some research for a upcoming video where i'm like revisiting i am um that's a great video by the way everyone should watch it i'm sure you've seen it it's thank wonderful you. i though. appreciate that i can't remember oh wait wait, wait 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 this is it oh they were part of the um so the guy who was like one of their top spokespeople um was an exit uh, a member of the executive committee of the friends of new germany in 1934 so yeah oh nazi organization set up by german immigrants to support nazis they were like outright nazis yeah not even like hiding no, it yeah but all the fbi files of i am are like oh yeah we we think they might be communists i'm like what like the opposite, the exact opposite. Yeah, yeah, it's not crazy. quite. <laughs> yeah, they're like vehement anti-communist Nazis. Right. That's what they were. And then it oh, kind of, you know, well, it's one of those things where you can kind of track how the fascistic ideals sort of like evolved in UFOs. Yes. I mean, like someone smarter. William Dudley Pally was like another contactee, right? Because he had yeah. that thing, it was like seven uh, something seconds in eternity or something, which again was like a contactee esque experience. And he created his own like UFO religion called Soulcraft. Yep. Yeah. I mean, like, and you mentioned Bill Cooper. I mean, like, that guy is about, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, I'm not going to say names, but there's a couple of people who remind me of him today, uh, like Bill Cooper 2.0s. I'm sure people can figure out who I'm talking about, but uh, you know, he truly. I I have like a theory about him where he used UFOs to get attention to push his right wing agenda because yeah, there, he he got into ufology, made kind of a big splash because he was this bombastic, charismatic guy who was a good speaker and he could extemporaneously talk about this stuff, which I don't think a lot of people could, you know, in the UFO field at the time. 
And so everyone started listening to him. And then all of a sudden he pulled the rug out and said, like, UFOs are all fake. It's all disinformation for, by the government. Yes. Now we need to talk about the Patriot movement. And he started his, you know, radio show. And yeah. there we go. He was like pro-militia, you know, pro-take down the government. And it, it, putting a lot of dangerous ideas out into the world. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was, you know, like in, involved in a lot of the Montauk stuff. Um, both no, in Cooper the was? books, no, but oh, oh. there was a lot. There was a well, well, kind of a tangentially, Maybe. like uh -huh. the, the pe some of the people he he was, he seemed to be quite pally pally with Vladimir Tzisky, who was uh -huh. another Nazi, um, and I don't mind calling him an outright Nazi because that's what he was. Um, whether he's, I don't even know whether he's still alive at this point. He, he's another one of these like disappearing ufologists. Ooh, yeah. uh, but him, him, and uh, he, he apparently like used to follow Bill Cooper around to go to like all of his lectures and be in the front row of all of his lectures. Yeah. But Vladimir Tzitzky is one of the guys who like really heavily pushed Alternative Three being real, and like the footage at the end of Alternative Three being um being a uh, actual footage of uh landing on mars i mean it's just all fucking nonsense but it's like it, it like people believe it and then it, they get funneled into into these other extremist groups right so it's like um there was like a i don't want to go into detail on it because it's quite horrific and i would rather not think about it but there was a there was a story that came out this week about um an extremist group that's operating on operating online i don't even want to say the name because i don't want to like put it on the radar but i think it was on wired.com the story um and basically it's like these uh, networks of like horrific things to do with children and oh, um extremist groups and like not hardcore nazi groups as well um and they kind of like get they they're also kind of like involved in like satanism and stuff but a lot of it is like trying to like lure people in and then like funnel them into this like extremist um ideology ideology also to exploit them and i feel like there's like i i don't know like how how many of these people actually believe in like going back to like the ufo world people like bill cooper how many of them actually believed in ufos or were like you say trying to like funnel people into it, oh the you you believe in this right yeah. oh well, i believe in this as well yeah. do you know the what about what about this what about this bit of like nazi propaganda you know like right. that kind of stuff like funneling people in that way and, and and you know like if i mean i feel like you know i think bill cooper was a very like dark not a great person but mm -hmm. you can't say he was an idiot like the, i think the guy was like one of those people who you know was able to convince he, he saw a group of people who were easily malleable and I can, i'm like i can get in their head and if i can get them to believe in ufos then i can get them to believe in my you know right-wing fascist ideology mm -hmm. and like mm -hmm. i don't have any like evidence that was what he was doing but it sure seems like it to me <laughs> you know yeah. like, just it just like that and and that's where this kind of field becomes just so like because uh, again like what we were saying like you, you go from like this kind of like really interesting like folksy story right of like person you know i was this ufo experience and then you look at this like wider field and yeah. it's just like it, it, i feel like it needs <laughs> how do I phrase this? There's like a cleaning of house that right. I think has been long overdue. Yeah. And a lot of these like skeletons need to be like pulled out of the, out of the closet and they need to, it needs to be spoken about. And I feel like a lot more of that is happening now more it so is. than, than it ever has been. Well, and there's and like, also a, a thirst for it. I think people are really yeah. excited to learn. I mean, there's certain people who don't want to hear this new information because it, you know, disconfirms their belief system. But then there's people yeah. like, I guess myself and, your listeners who are mm. really excited to learn about these new details, you know, because some of these yeah. small details that you've uncovered, even just recently, like the one you told me about today, mm. that's kind of a big deal, you know, like yeah. it's so, yeah, it's like that. Th I feel like that's, I, I'm kind of glad that there's like a very a small community of people who've got a love for this topic, yeah, but want to kind of get like, how do I say, the filth out of it, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah. You're, you're, I mean, you are our UFO gender. <laughs> Not 
sweep it up, <laughs> no. giving it a good power wash, like I said in my podcast. Oh, you know, good like, Lord. It, it, I don't, see, the thing is, I don't even know if it's capable of being washed at this point. <laughs> it's I think it's just permanently stained. It's stained. I think you're probably unfortunately. right. Unfortunately. Yeah. But, you know, like, I, I don't know. I, and again, like, we were talking about missing ufologists and it's like this stuff does drive you crazy so i don't i understand why people do dip out of it right, right because right. when you start to like not only realize that a lot of the things that you once believed to be true like i was i was talking earlier with my boyfriend about how i um like credulously uh believed in like the 2017 Lou Elizondo stuff and Bo and you know Bob Lazar and and I didn't think like and and that's weird for me because I've always been like slightly you know like a con bit conspiracy minded you know right. always a little bit like not trusting right. and it's and it's strange for me to look back and think like god I watched that um Lou Elizondo on 60 minutes and like thought like oh my god <laughs> he's gonna tell us the truth <laughs> yeah. oh my god. Like, like that's crazy to me right 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 and, but I think you do get to a point where like You've got you when you kind of like take it, take a step back, and you're like, "Fucking, I've been, I've just been believing in nonsense. So much of this is lies, mm -hmm. and it, it just makes you go like, I, I'm not sure if I can be bothered now. But that at that point, I feel like that's the point that I got to, and I was like, "Oh no, actually, like I still love this topic, so that's why I want to like, I don't know, like make make videos that yeah. are, um, you know." And entertaining and kind of still, you know, a, a you know, not looking down on people that do believe, but kind right. of going like, this is, this is not true, you know. And yeah. I've only recently started making videos about like ufology, um, like last year, and I've only made a couple, but I've like, you know, got the got the scripts written for like well got the scripts like half written for like five different videos but can never get around to finishing them <laughs> right right but you know it, it is is like as unpleasant as this because i i kind of think for me like just you know i've been into this stuff since i was a kid and mm -hmm. to me it does feel like the most boring time mm -hmm. it's 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 well it's boring and it's exciting in a sense because i feel like what you're doing and like what you know expanding frontiers is doing and just like kind of the community maybe we kind of roll around in and mm -hmm. you know like john tenney earlier who spoke up like i mean like these people are great some of the smartest mm -hmm. people i've ever met in my life entertaining and they have a very level head about this stuff yeah. and they have a genuine love and passion for this stuff yes but i think cleaning it up and exposing that to me is actually a, is is the most exciting part about ufos the the phenomenon it's, itself is actually really boring right now i mean like you know <laughs> it, it, like, I, I don't even know like there, it's like there's there's no like contactee stories there's no like you know mm. uh humanoids coming off like saucers anymore like you know so it's like it's kind of just a stale time and, and so much of it is focused on disclosure you know and in this and i'm just like oh my god it's a political <laughs> thriller it's like i want more fantasy give me the fantasy <laughs> stuff give me the real weirdness and i feel like ufos have, are not weird right now and it's it's bumming no. me out man <laughs> no. yeah that's why sometimes you've got to like move on move on to you got to just take a little bit of a break from it yeah and that's yeah. when you go to bigfoot or you know you go to black yeah. area black panthers hanging out down yeah. by a riverside Dog man. yes yeah, yeah bring there's on. a really big like going back to like the local stuff there's a I, I a couple of years ago i stumbled upon um i think it's uh east yorkshire um has like a really big I say big it's not not necessarily big but they've got a community there of like high strangeness researchers but a lot mm. of it um kind of revolves around um dog man Excellent. so there's tons oh weirdly there was like tons and I was it, uh, at some at one point I was having conversations with a guy who'd had a lot of experiences and he was a uh he's a a not not hunt is the wrong word like tracker mm -hmm. he goes out he kind of like does you know field investigations tracks yeah. them he's got a massive map on his wall where he's he like smelling the dirt out. you bet yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And he had an experience when he was younger 
he was in like the national press here and they kind of you know made a mockery of him because of course that's what they do um they write it they go oh yeah we're going to write about your experiences and then they write it up and they you know take the piss yeah, yeah. especially the british press um but he seemed like a really nice guy and i was, was talking to him for a while about making a documentary about him because he was just such an interesting guy oh, that'd be awesome. Good regular guy lived in this like small town and had all these dogman experiences and now goes out tracking him but i have i never managed to follow through with it because it's just so expensive to like get a crew together and and film something but yeah. those little like communities you you get surprised by like how many there are like very local and they're all kind of like it, it's centered around this one part of yorkshire and there's all these like yorkshire uh conferences and stuff and it's like it's kicking off up there that's I mean, what you I, need you need to get over there i you do to... and i find this all that stuff so adorable and i don't mean that to sound like in a like you know disingenuous way like i find it so like like folksy and weird yeah. and a wonderful way to spend a saturday afternoon is going to see Absolutely. like like three weirdos talk about Dogman. And the funny thing about Dogman, Dogman right now is kind of the cryptid du jour as far as oh, really? I can tell. Oh, Dogman is having a moment, Dogman sister. is back. Oh, he is back, baby. <laughs> oh, you bet. No, I mean, like, it, it really, like, I, you know, I do lurk around these, like, you know, cryptid reporting sites or, you know, monster reporting sites, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. It does seem like, obviously, Bigfoot has never been bigger at least to me, it seems like, I mean, Bigfoot's now like a total official American folk hero. There's mm -hmm. Bigfoot stickers in like Los Angeles. People will have it in the back of their car. So, I mean, it's everywhere. All over Nebraska, people have Bigfoot stickers. They'll have Bigfoot like six foot tall things in their yard. Like, keep out, you know, like, and, and it's just become like this like mythological mascot for America right now. And I it's, love that. I, and I do too. I think with all like, you know, America's got so many like really bad problems and i think it's like maybe bigfoot is the great uniter maybe bigfoot's like dolly parton where it's like everyone can agree it's awesome you know like <laughs> yeah oh my god yeah bigfoot as yeah, just do... a symbol to me is like fun you know it, do you it's watch any a... bob gimlin do i watch him yeah like does he have a show or something i mean i've on seen YouTube. him interviewed i'm sorry on youtube he's got no. a youtube channel bob gimlin oh, i didn't know that you haven't watched it no oh my god God! Oh my you God! Much Gimlin videos? I'm getting off right now. Sorry, ending the stream <laughs> early. <laughs> he does like um, he does like uh, Bigfoot encounters, but they're like illustrated. So he has like an Ill illustrator who does oh. like the illustrations of the video, and then he will like recount the stories. That's fantastic. And he's got like a um. He's got, yeah, he's got quite, a, he's, he's like really pop. I'm surprised that you've never watched him. I have, I mean, like, I honestly, you know, like I love I love Bigfoot and the idea of Bigfoot. I but I have not read a ton of Bigfoot books. Right. One because I mean, like I think I've read Joshua Cutch and, and Timothy Renner's book. They have a two volume series called Where the Footprints End, and that's about like paranormal Bigfoot. Yeah. And to me, that's just a lot sexier, and I like the idea because I, like, like I really don't believe that there's a flesh and blood Bigfoot that we haven't discovered in the fossil records. I, I feel like. Right. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that, but like that's what I I, I don't think that is possible. Like, right. I, really, I think that's. And where do you but... stand on um, Patterson Gimlin film? Ooh, boy, <laughs> you, you son of a, uh, like, well, okay. Uh, I loved. I love it as an artistic <laughs> like piece of film. I think it's Oscar worthy and beautiful. I mean, I I don't know. I will say this, and this is what I will say, is that it is so well done like i think it is the you know if it is a hoax and it's a fake they nailed it yeah. because the suit is great you know like and if you're if you're to believe the researchers the strides it took were you know a human could do that <laughs> and i i haven't been there the i didn't take measurements myself but, i mean it's got which let me the tell you this. He, 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 well you know <laughs> i'm gonna pause right there because this is something i'm adamant about and i i've actually spoken about bigfoot here and i always refer to bigfoot as she Right. Because if you every book, every Bigfoot TV show, every Bigfoot podcast, they're like he, 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 yeah. he. They always refer to it as a he. Yet all Bigfoot people agree that Patty mm -hmm. from Patterson Gimlin was a female. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And so you can I tell mean, like, the chick. It, it's there's you know this misogyny in the Bigfoot community. I'm a guy. You know, <laughs> we, we, it, you know, like it could be a he or a her apparently. So let's let's get that straight. But what do I think? Do I think it's genuine, like a genuine Bigfoot? 
I just would have to say, I don't know. I want to believe it's That's genuine. Fine. You know, I just don't. I mean, like, if I had to, like, bet my life on it, I probably would have bet my life on it. But I feel okay wanting to believe in that. I'm on the same as you. At some point, um, my friend Bradley's going to come on here and uh, argue, uh, uh, well, not argue, but put forward the case for Patterson Gimlin being accurate uh, an accurate depiction or a real video so i'm looking forward to that because yeah. uh, looking forward to being bigfoot pilled i know what we were saying earlier about um you know like bigfoot being a bit of an escape and i'm going to um a bigfoot uh convention in june Hell but yes. apparently apparently this bigfoot festival has been kind of like not overrun but there's like a real connection between like bigfoot and trump stuff now like a lot of trumpers are like kind of taking on the god damn it man god damn it uh I, I don't i don't doubt it you know secret. yeah i mean i i went to a bigfoot conference like a year ago and i it was it, i mean like there was definitely a trumpy vibe there and yeah. um there also there was a lot of people coming up to me and talking about the Nephilim, which is like, you know, oh, yeah. a biblical story or something <laughs> like that. And that that is where like that's that's almost like the same thing as like disclosure people to me. I'm like, oh, oh yeah. God. And they're so certain that it is. <laughs> they're they're not they're I mean, they're like, this is what it is. You know, yeah. like I actually did this one lady's Bigfoot like podcast not too long ago, and she sent me a link to the when the show came out and it was a you know YouTube show. And somehow I never ever do this, but I read the comments. Right. And most of the comments were like, this guy doesn't know shit. He doesn't know that they the Smithsonian has giant bones in the bottom. You know, like, <laughs> and they're saying, like, this guy's an idiot. He needs to do some research. And, I'm, and I, I want to respond back and engage and say, like, okay, if there's giant bones in the Smithsonian, I would love to see him. I'm I, I'm all ears. Show me that stuff. Like, but there's just no, I know a lot of people, you know, and then there's people who say, like, well, they have hair follicles and like dermal ridge you know footprints i'm like all right cool i don't know what that really tells me though like that's not like yeah actual at some evidence. point people are just operating in delusion land yeah so it's like it's I, like I, um it's like the people that believe in like tartaria right you know? <laughs> right i you know i have a good friend who like actually that made him crazy oh god it, it, it turned him nuts <laughs> yeah it's like i hope he's not listening right now but yeah it actually he went <laughs> bananas over this tartaria oh, he wouldn't stop talking god. about it and I was like, oh boy, you're losing <laughs> me, pal. I, I've got a friend who went a bit down the queue thing. Yeah. yeah that's not yeah, good. Always gets a little bit rapey. It does. Should we get back to um, missing ufologists and oh. the person that you prepared? I thought you'd never ask. Oh, yeah, I so did. Right. And I'm not going to read them all because also I, I feel like, you know, I'm going to credit uh, John Lundberg, who. I just think him and Mark, what Mark Pilkington did with Mirage Men, the documentary, and then Mark Pilkington's book, Mirage Men, was a real eye opener for me when I read it. It was one of those books oh, that I read, so put down, and I was like, I kind of had a stomach ache where I was like, oh no, a lot of these things I loved as a kid are not true, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. and, and he put forth such an amazing, you know, they both did such an amazing argument for disinformation and how it's yeah. used and the propaganda behind it all. It's just yes. wonderful. But John, so. Gosh, I want to say maybe about a decade ago, I was on a UFO forum and I was reading about this guy named Armin Victorian. Mm -hmm. And I had never really, heard, I think maybe I'd, I'd seen his name or heard about him, but I started reading more. And as someone linked uh, a, this website, and it was to this website called The Mythologist. Mm -hmm. And I've come to find this there was a documentary created about Armin Victorian by John Lundberg in 2004, I think mm -hmm. for the BBC and I'm not even sure if it ran. It probably did. But this website had a lot of information and articles about him. And I'm like, oh, this guy is so deeply wild and fascinating. And <clears throat> so I, for about eight years, I was bugging poor John Lundberg. I would like write to him like twice a year. So like, hey, man, is there any way I can get a copy of that? I, I'll, I'll, I'll accept any, any amount of money you want, you know? And he's like, I'd love to get a copy of it too, but it's like behind lock and key at the BBC for some reason. Anyway, so the, the the documentary ended up getting released like a year ago, and it was totally worth the wait. It's fantastic. It, like 
first off, I love the way it looks. It really is like a harkening back to the early 2000s, like documentary style. I think it was shot like a 16 millimeter That's probably. Amazing. It has a good like grainy feel to it. Should we and, show a tiny bit of it? Sure. To you know, Can I run to the bathroom while you do it? Of course. Yes, okay. take a bathroom I'll, break I'll and I'll right play back. a little bit of this. Um, if I can get it going and hopefully I don't get copyright flagged. Um, we'll just show like the first uh, minute or so. Um, okay. So this is um this is the documentary that Steve was referring to. I forgot it starts kind of slow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go to like the middle. Maybe go to like the 15-minute mark. It might get, it, I think it starts getting juicy right there. Oh, I oh, love yeah. this. That, that, that guy, yeah, I think uh, Ir Irving is his last name. He, he's great. He, and he knows a lot about Ar Ar Henry. Okay, I'm going to pause it there because I feel like um, we need to give a bit of context. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> unfortunately, so, there's not like a trailer. For right, this. right, right. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to give like, you know, the most, you know, slimmed down version of it. Yeah. So he was this, you know, he was born in Armenia. We we know that for certain, I believe. And then oh, there's no sound either. There was no sound. In oh, that. there wasn't? Well, no. So it was pointless anyway. I, I would just... highly, I mean, I feel like everyone who likes your work is going to really find <laughs> this documentary is, quite fascinating it is great. i'll leave it i'll leave a link to it um in the I, hang on a second i'll put a um i'll put a link in now can do we have sound now do we have sound now i just want to check and make sure that we've got sure. sound now um this is the documentary that we are referring to put it in the okay cool oh my dad's here Oh, That's hey, nice to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, carry on. Yeah, okay. So, um, you know, I don't know how much of this can be verified, but, like, he apparently claimed to be a diplomat, an adventurer, an orchid smuggler, which definitely was true, a cropsicle researcher, a UFO investigator, a phone pest, and a diplomatic f fixer, and a man in black. But this guy, like, to cut to the chase, he came on the scene in the early 90s in Nottingham and there was a small little UFO group and some crop circle researchers and he started kind of infiltrating showing up at these things and kind of like grilling people about their information in kind of an aggressive way that was like making people nervous like who is this guy you know like and he'd have a briefcase and always like you know be shuffling documents and you know really making himself look important or really almost like a spy you know, and he kind of was like dropping, he was making himself really seem like he was highly connected to some, and that's the way I perceive it, to an intelligence agency of some sort. Yeah. But really quick before that, he was absolutely a four-time convicted orchid smuggler, but he also made a really legitimate contribution. He actually discovered a rare orchid and they named it like some kind of Latin name, Henry Armin. Okay. So he, he really was a big player in the orchid world, <laughs> the orchid scene, <laughs> which we all know about. Um, oh, yeah. But, you know, he, he, some people thought he was a Russian spy. Uh, Robert Irving, who is that man they, you know, you showed for a moment, you know, he said mm -hmm. it was like opening a box tinged with fact and fiction, but you don't know which parts are fact and which parts are fiction. But another thing he started doing, which kind of, I think, what he's kind of famous for, if he's famous for anything in the UFO world is he was somehow 
ringing up like high level people at the CIA, MI5, is it MI5 or MI6? Uh, MI, MI5, I believe. MI5, okay, yeah. And then like the British police. Or but he was he was like calling like high level military people in America and high level people at the CAA recording their conversations and he was like I and for a while those conversations were available online and literally integrity like like interrogating these people like people like if I name some of the names you'd be like wow that that's ballsy like yeah. so this and you know even Greg Bishop who uh, is a good buddy of mine who wrote Project Beta another great book that's related to these worlds as well. Mm -hmm. He's he, when in the '90s, Greg had a magazine called Excluded Middle, which was kind of a hipster outsider culture UFO parapolitics magazine. And Armin, I guess, or you know, he called himself Dr. Armin Victorian. He had many names. He went, his, he had a uh, Henry Azadel, which is the real name, Dr. Armin Victorian, uh, Kasaba Untuba. He when he would pretend to be a Kenyan journalist. <laughs> I mean, like you know, he had all these like you know pseudonyms, and it was quite amazing but greg said he called him up and was like demanding addresses and phone numbers of like ufologists and he was collecting all these information all this information constantly on the phone just constantly harassing people mm -hmm. and you know he uh, uh, would you know there was a uh, uk investigator named i think eric morris i can't remember his first name is something morris but he was researching uh this alleged ufo crash in cornwall in 1985 and henry went over to his house to look at his documents and then stole like the important parts of all these documents and then took them home and then the you know ufologist was like hey man i want my papers back what's, what's the deal <laughs> and he's like not gonna do it buddy you know you're gonna have to pay me a large fee to get those back and so he's like holding him at ransom so he was he was always doing extremely shady stuff right you know, and like the 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 I think like the fact that he was uh, it, it's it's one of those things where that's weird. No one can really put the the thing. It's like what was he doing all this for? Like he came in out of nowhere for a few years, made this huge splash in the U, you know locally at least in the UK and kind of internationally, where he was really like bothering a lot of like high level people in the military and intelligence agencies. And it it does make you wonder. It's like, was this guy an intelligence agent himself? I I don't know if he was, but like, I'm not sure what the hell he was doing. Like with all this stuff, you know. Like, Link and, then he, like, it's, it, and that's the thing. I don't. And I don't think. Um, and maybe John Lundberg knows really what he was doing or what his like goal was. But I don't know that. Like I've done as much research as I possibly can to try to figure it out, but. See, I when I I found something earlier when I looked him up, and now I'm going to have to go find it again. Um, and it was where was it? It might take me a minute to find yeah. it. He was also kind of the guy who was outing a lot of people in the aviary. He was finding it. That's, that's it. That's, he was famous that's for that I, too. Yeah, and he said that he was going to expose everyone. Yeah, and he, I mean, I think he kind of did, though, too, because I think, you know, he, I I can't remember which people he did, but I think he did out a few people. And I don't, and they, and, and another thing, he was, he was really interested in mind control and even wrote a book that's very hard to find now, but it's called Mind Controllers. So he was right. deeply interested in MK Ultra ish type of stuff. I wonder if that was because what when did that when did he pu pu publish mind controllers? Oh shoot, I don't know. Also, I accidentally banned someone from the chat. Nature Squad, I accidentally banned you from the chat because I went to remove your comment about uh something that might I don't know. You said delete it. So I went to delete a comment and I accidentally banned you. So I apologize. And I've been desperately trying to figure out how to unban you. Um, so just bear with me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take it personally, man. <laughs> yeah, don't take it personally. I'm 
so sorry. I'm trying to like figure oh. out how to do it. But I would say, what when did he release Mind Control? Is? That I'm not certain of. I would I would say it was probably like you know mid '90s at the latest. Because I mean, he really was only around for like a f- couple or a few years. And so really... I wonder what Martin thinks of that because this is this is Martin uh, Martin Cannon. And if and nobody's gone to see his channel, I would highly recommend it. If you like my videos, you're going to love the videos on his channel. They're great. Um, some of them are, um, you know, quite short. Um, and they are fascinating watches. I would highly, highly, highly. Oh, recommend did Martin? Them. So it sounds like Martin had interaction with uh, Henry or Armin or whatever you want to call him. They bugged his phone. The bug was on the cover of the UK magazine called Lobster. Interesting. Yeah, he did claim to have, they were putting like bugs in his wall socket. They were messing with his phone box outside and bugging his phone and his email and all that stuff. So bizarre. Yeah, so he was obviously I, a I, highly you, paranoid you person. Sent me, you sent me this documentary a while back just after I've been on your podcast. You're right. like, oh, you have a look at this. Right. And I only got around to watching it recently. I'd never really looked at it because there's too many of these um strange characters to like. Oh, yeah. I feel like once you find one strange char- character, they kind of become like your guy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So like Armand Victorians kind of become your guy. He, I mean like he has been for a while. <laughs> yeah. And like the, the thing is is that like I got like this like delicious teaser when I discovered uh the clips of this documentary Mm -hmm. and then all the articles that were on the website but then for 10 years like this documentary was really my ufological white whale that i felt like someday lundberg is going to get the rights back and he'll be able to show it to people (laughs) but he did and he he actually was super nice and and like direct messaged me when the day it came out he's like all right buddy here you go you can finally stop bothering me (laughs) you know but but you know uh i was uh actually speaking with john this week and he he gave me a couple other tidbits that he was saying he's like in the documentary it kind of seems like he had just a few interactions actually with henry but he for about a year on and off he was going to his house interviewing him he actually interviewed him for a documentary before the mythologist called the the influence the influencers machine or the influencing machine influencing machine yeah which i need to see if it's available but yeah, he said he went over to uh, Henry's house and he w- saw his garage, and his garage was from front to back full of boxes of FOIA requests, like thousands and mm-hmm. thousands of different FOIA requests and just different documents. So he definitely was deeply interested in some way, and maybe it was just like a lot of people with UFOs. He just had an extreme obsession and curiosity about this stuff. Mm-hmm. But it, it, it What's is. What's your take? Oh, I mean, it's hard to say. Maybe he was just one of those guys with a lot of tenacity and was able to just say, like, I'm going to call the CIA and see if I can talk to this person and it was able to. Or I'm going to call the naval intelligence and see if I can just talk to, like, a general or something like that. You know, but, like, I guess in my mind, that's it seems really hard to get a lot of these people on the phone. I mean, and this is me being conspiratorial, but, like, there is, like, a 10% of me that feels like he was definitely, like maybe involved in some intelligence not necessarily yeah. american or british but some sort of intelligence gathering op- operation yeah because he was grilling researchers military people who were purportedly involved in all these paranormal government testing things and then he just disappears yeah and he's, he's <laughs> gone and I, disappear. gone, gone vanished and in and, and like He's apparently like his wife, he him and his wife supposedly, you know, this is what John told me this week. Supposedly him and his wife got divorced. His wife moved to Italy, but I think he still lives in the UK somewhere. So I'm sorry, Emily, but you're gonna have to track him down and interview him and find out what's been happening the last like 30 oh, years of his life. Oh god, <laughs> absolutely not. Absolutely not. I've got too many. There's too many people taking up too much space in my head. I can't have enough of one. All right. Well, I mean. I, I, I mean, like, I, I would love, I would just love to know because, like, when you watch this this documentary, this wonderful, wonderful documentary that John Lumber made, I think you'll just see. I feel like I'm, I really did a disservice to how. Um, oh, Tenny said it used to be easy; just calling worked more often than you think, and that's probably the case. You could probably, you know, you probably just call him up. Um, the blame. But you know, it is. It, it's just it. It, he's deeply fascinating and I feel like a very unique character in the UFO field because while there's a lot of like fun shady characters who are in, mm-hmm. you know involved in the disinformation thing 
it's so unclear to me what his intent and goal was. And that makes it all the more fascinating. It is bizarre, isn't it? It's yeah. yeah. It and I'm looking at his book, Doctor Armand Victorian, The Mind Controllers. And when did this come out? Let's have a look. 1999. The battle for men's minds can be a dirty business for decades. The secret services of world powers have sought new ways to control the way people think and act. Mind controllers reveals how the US, USSR and the UK conducted highly questionable experiments with psychic techniques. I mean, yeah. I'm interested in in what this um I mean, I've never read this book. Yeah, I know. I'm I had so to try to get a copy immediately. Is it available online anywhere? Um, also, does it involve like UFO stuff in it as well? Because if it does, I feel like I, I don't know. I, I am, I, I've just never read it. I've never yeah, seen I, it. I, I mean, like from the excerpts, I you can find ex, or at least you could find excerpts of it online and like reviews of it online. And it did seem it was like pretty focused on the mind control aspect right. and like psychotronics. Right. And I think when he when he did, I remember hearing the recording he did with John Alexander. Mm -hmm. And it was him grilling him about psychotronic weapons. Right. So interesting. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm just looking at the at the website as well. I yeah, I mean, he was talking about a lot of the stuff that people talk about often now. But so he was kind of a hipster, you know, like a mm -hmm. a scene starter in a way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I'll just um share what I'm looking. Yeah, at. that's oh, the website, and, and the website is super valuable. I think you know, there's a, there's a great kind of summary. Of him and what, he, them. what transpired. He goes by many. Oh, bloody hell! What's happened there? So that's him. Yep. Dig a little deeper, and Armand's life starts to resemble that of a la latter-day Walter Mitty, yeah. diplomat, adventurer, UFO investigator. Was this the secret life of a Nottingham shop assistant? It's a very good documentary. It is yeah. very good. It's very like. Um, yeah, it, it's I, I I just don't I I genuinely do not know. I yeah. don't have like a a um a, a, even a th to me, I would say he's got the hallmarks of an intelligence asset agent, whatever you want to say. I mean, you know? You know, there's an With argument to be made for that. Those kind of movements around, you know, like those yeah. that I just um yeah. It gives that vibe to me. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely vibes of that. But then it also could just be one of those guys. He's, he's like, look, all these ufologists are just, you know, pussyfooting around. I'm interested in this stuff. I'm just going to call the CIA. And like Tenny so said. I'm going to find out if MJ-12 is real. Right, right. And like, you know, like John was just saying, you know, he's like back in the, maybe, or maybe it still is this easy. But like you could just call and like, you know, you would have some luck sometimes. So maybe he was just it like it's remarkably easy, I think, to talk to certain people. Right. And I wonder, like, because I was surprised that I got an interview with like Rick Doty, right? I'm but surprised I think you did then, too. I mean, that's kind of crazy. Then I think like maybe that's that's on purpose, you know, wants to get get as much like story out as possible. So I don't maybe maybe some people have like an air of being like, I will never they'll never talk, but right. Maybe they do. Sometimes well, I think some of us just too scared to ask. Totally, totally. And I, I would be one of those people who's too scared to ask, probably. But like, I remember seeing when Mirage Men came out, and that was because I had read about Doty in like you know I followed the Serbo case and all that stuff, and he was always you know like people figured it out pretty quick that you know he was probably doing it. And that uh, man's got like the worst opsec ever. Like <laughs> that he just like I mean he's even got like his um his email address linked up with like his porn account <laughs> that people can just go find. It's, it's weird. It's like, what it's are you doing <laughs> Yeah. I, but I, he was, he was, you know, Doty for a while though, I will admit he was kind of like, I, I did have like an obsession about learning more about him and like wanting oh, to see yeah, him. That's... And when Rajman came out in the documentary, I was like, Oh my God, there he is. Like this elusive figure. Like I was, I was yeah. like, I remember, like, I, I couldn't even breathe when he, like, came on the screen, you know? Like, I was just, oh I had been gosh, reading about him for so long. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, right? You know? I, I, I don't, I still don't have really have an opinion on him. Like, that man lies. He wakes oh. up in the morning and just starts telling lies. Like, he'll lie straight to your face. That man will sit there and say to you, I was never on UFO cover-up live. That wasn't me. It's like, bruh, yeah. that was you. Completely. Was, like, 
for real? Yeah, completely. Who else is that? Looks exactly yeah. like you, sounds like you. Yeah. Who else is it going to be? He's like, no, no, no. I absolutely, I, it could not have been me. I could not have even been there. I never it's would have said strawberry ice cream. Yeah, and then it's like, you know, is you another researcher, great researcher, Christian Lambright, and I think I mentioned him mm -hmm. on last week's um, show with Tanner. He did a lot of research um, on Doty yeah. and found Doty's posts on a History Channel message board linked to his email um, and Doty was talking about being present at a CIA black site in Laos. Um, it, I've forgotten the year. Um, and uh, it turns out that John Lear was at the same um, really? CIA black site. John <laughs> Lear actually oh. had the map of that specific site on his, like framed in his office on the wall. All very bizarre. Um, when I asked Frank Doughty about it, and I was like, Christian Lambright puts this together, he says, you know, it's in his book, these History Channel messages that you left on this History Channel where you said that you were at a CIA black site in Laos. And he's like, wasn't me. There's lots of other Rick Doughty's. <laughs> It's so many Rick Doty's knocking about. There's oh, like man. ten of them. I've got loads of like, you know, oh. um, you know. So, well, let me ask. Um, let me ask you this because I feel like you know about as much about Rick Doty as anyone, and you've spoken with him. What? How much of what he has like done or like you know mucked up the works? Do you think was? It, just him as an independent contractor, just because he likes to be this trickster guy messing with people, or do you think he is doing it at the behest of someone else? Um, I think now he's he's a free agent. Mm -hmm. I think up until, I think potentially Serpo was him just by himself. Right. Well, not not by himself, not necessarily by himself, but like I don't, I'm not necessarily convinced that like Serpo was a was it like a an op, right? Per se, right? Um, but again, I I haven't like deep dived into Serpo, so that's sub uh, that oh, opinion boy. is um <laughs> that opinion yeah. is subject to change. Careful in there, it's uh, a <laughs> it's nothing. <laughs> um, but I think everything involved uh, when he was at AFOSI when um up until what was it late 80s that he got he he no longer was working there i think that um what he was doing was sanctioned and then but then even potentially afterwards maybe just like off the but i just don't yeah, know yeah i, I, mean, I do always wonder about that someone now yeah i know he's i know he's working for thomas fessler on disclosure tonight so <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> Is that really work? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but I mean, like, you know, he, he is like, I mean, like, you know, he is obviously, and what, what's astounding to me is that, again, here he is, you know, kind of like, he, he's one of those guys who pops up from time to time, mm -hmm. but he's now popped up and just kind of stayed here since the whole disclosure yeah. activism is like been flourishing. And I can, yeah. I mean, if you, you know, like, Every once in a while, I'll go like on the UFO Twitter just to like you know make myself sick because I'm I hate myself or something. <laughs> but the amount of people taking Rick Doty seriously and that he is an authority on it boggles the mind, doesn't it? It boggles the mind, and that that's where it actually like depresses me a little bit because I I just you know I'm like it doesn't take that much digging around to f discover that he is the last person to be trusted like yeah. <laughs> you know Absolutely. so but he's also this is an interesting comment it seems highly possible that operations of this nature were done at sensitive military bases across the country and this is kind of i i feel like i've i feel like a broken record when it comes to this but i think that doty is um almost designed to be where everybody looks yeah. and i'm guilty of that as well we all are because everybody in in this field gives him attention yep. but he's the person that you're supposed to look at right yep. um and it's uh, and i there's definitely a, th a thread a thread that's probably not the right word but like there's a there's kind of maybe a trend now of like oh don't he was just a rogue agent he just kind of went off the rails himself he just did all yeah. this himself that kind of thing and it's like I don't I don't necessarily think so and yeah. then I think it's also very convenient to think that it's just one rogue guy and a lot of people forget that like um 
So I'm assuming that everyone in here knows who Rick Doty is. If you don't know who he is, I mean, it's on my channel. So you, I've mentioned him on my channel before. Right. And also, yeah, I've done like an interview with him. Some clips have been in some videos. So I'm assuming that everybody knows who he is. But he was obviously involved in... in um, disseminating disinformation on behalf of the air force but he wasn't the only person involved in that no he himself gives various different names of other people that were involved um but it, it, on some of the documentation there's different um people involved um from kirtland air force base so i think for people to think that it was just some kind of like rogue agent going it alone is um I don't want to say like ignorant because I don't mean that in a rude way, but I mean, I think it's like, I don't see how that could possibly be true. I yeah. And I feel like, like, you know, you'd have to suppose that he would be like, you know, like almost like, I feel like that's something he could get in a lot of trouble for, especially Absolutely. when he was an active agent. We, we know for sure Absolutely. he was working for OS, 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 and AFOSI. Oh, thank yeah. you. AFOSI. So yeah. we know that for certain. Yeah. And if you know that he brought this... Linda Mo Moulton Howe into an Air right. Force base, interrogated yep. her. Yep. And, and... <laughs> poor Linda. <laughs> I know. Oh, no, man. She's just buying everything, isn't she? But, um, <laughs> oh, boy. I, I, it was funny because I was such a huge fan of hers when I was like a kid. I thought she was like the gospel for <laughs> UFO stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, and, and, and she was on art bell show all the time which you know loved art bell show i did too oh so much. Uh, loved, loved it when it came back in like 2015 mm -hmm. when it was doing midnight in the desert yeah and i go back and, and i listen i put it on i generally fall asleep to it yeah um now uh, -huh. uh i still listen to it as well <laughs> and i and i'll sometimes be shocked at some of this i'm like oh, fucking like th th i'm like this is this is the stuff that i really like that's it was like very you listen to it now and you're like this is where all the nonsense was coming from like this kind of like yeah. art bell yeah um you know, it, the and, art bell circle but i almost wonder how much people like i mean i i because i was pretty young when art bell was going on or not not like that young but like it was i was i can't tell if people realized it was entertainment like you know the famous mm. area 51 color or mel's hole yes. or some of the big oh, things like Bell's hall just yeah. the best i believed that's it at the, the time thing. i will admit like that's the stuff about the art bell show that i love the open lines the absolute like the yeah. nutters that used to call yeah. in that's the bit that's fun when yeah. he's got like linda moulton howe on like george knapp or he's bringing on richard hoagland you know then it just goes into the nonsense <laughs> yeah. but when it's the open lines and it's the oh. callers and they come up with some of the most uh, baffling insane um stories that it's just Agreed. like you you <clears throat> cannot get that anymore no that is, it just like yeah. you know and, and he, Radio he, he, he was such a talented entertainer because mm -hmm. like you know obviously like a lot of these stories i'm i kind of think probably he just made them up and like had his buddy pretend to be mel and like you know had like a what stable a of like theater players who would call in you know and like what the area story and, and, is. i mean we're still talking about it right now there's a radio show from the 90s and we're still talking about mel's hole and every once in a while i'll watch like a mel's hole video like yeah. on youtube about and, i've and, got it, one yeah <laughs> it's, it's, and it's great i mean like i love these stories and they're it's great. kind of the part of the folklore of all this stuff, and it doesn't. Well, and that story just got more and more and more elaborate as it oh, went yeah. on. It's just for you know when you when you start getting to like a sheep being lowered into into the hull, and <laughs> yeah, with like the fishing line, gets, yeah. Then it gets then it gets pulled back out, and then it's dead. But they cut it open, but inside is a seal with human eyes yes, that can yes. cure cancer. I mean, who comes up with that? And, and honestly. Like what you just said is what I love. I like I love crazy stuff like that. Like, and, and it's not because I love it because I think it's true. It's I love stories and I love entertainment. And Art Bell was an amazing, the most entertaining radio show of all time, in my opinion. Yeah. Like, and, oh, you know, yeah. I still listen to old episodes. Like, I fall asleep to it, like you do. And it when he's got like very happy. 
when he's got like this specific line, he's like, um, and tonight is the I'm married to a Martian line. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it it's was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it would be so interesting to have him around doing a show now. You know, I'm oh, sure. Yeah, I, I bet I'm sure he would have jumped all over him the... now. Yeah, he remember. probably would have been all over the disclosure stuff and like, we oh, got to yeah. press the government to, you know, like, he, he you know. Oh, absolutely. But... I, I, well, he was, he was, yeah, I worry he would be a bit, I don't, I, I feel like he would probably be, um, like on the kind of Tucker Carlson side. Yeah, I'm he, afraid always he, would. He, he always was. He always was. He was a libertarian. Yeah. I mean, he started, oh, he yeah. started out as a political, like a, I think a right wing political radio host in, yeah, outside of like, you know, Las Vegas. Yeah. So, yeah, it, that would track. But I got a big soft spot for him, you know, and yeah, you know, we, people are allowed to have differing opinions, but you know, sometimes it veers, um, veers in a horrific direction. And so. I, I also do think yeah, sometimes exactly. it's okay to was. separate the art from the artist a little bit, you know, where it's yeah, like, I, yeah, you know. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, you know, he's he. I'm not going to stop listening to Art Bell open lines just because I, you know, even though personally I find his politics to be abhorrent, yeah, yeah. Um, some of those open lines are comedy gold. Exactly. <laughs> they really are, though. I mean, you laugh out loud funny. Like, they really yeah. are. That's that another thing, like going back and listening to those, but especially with like where I'm at now, it, it, it just, I was like, God so many of these people this is like where they got their this was like their proving ground oh yeah you know, especially people like richard hoagland i know that he was around like for the throughout like the 80s and 90s but i feel like art bell really kind of like pushed him in oh yeah so like oh, yeah. and and art bell gave a platform to a lot of these people oh yeah well um, i mean richard hoagland was part of his like theater troupe you know he was a returning guest who would come on yes. and that's how i see our bell really exactly. it's almost like twilight zone where he had these yeah. He had these kind of semi regular, you know, like, hey man, the heavy hitter Linda's coming in on Thursday. Yeah, and, and Linda's going to give us a cattle in. mutilation update. You yeah. know, she's, she's going to come in with her data. And to be fair to her, like, I, I don't discount every single thing that Linda Martin has ever no. reported on. And I still no. stand by the fact that A Strange Harvest was a great documentary, I love even it. though it was a bit too credulous. Yeah. And there were elements that, anyway. But, at some point, I just don't know what happened. Like it just, it, it just, you know. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't. Maybe either. we evolved from it. Maybe we grew out of it. Maybe that that's what is, it is. That's a distinct possibility. Yeah. Um, you know, one person uh, for some reason, it, our bell remind me of uh, another missing ufologist or, or a Go vanishing on. ufologist who. who he, 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 he was. It was utter garbage what he was spouting out. Out, but it was a guy named Dan Burrish. Have you heard oh, of Dan Burrish? Oh, gosh. So Dan I'm, Burrish. I don't know mass, much about I'll him. I'll give you like a thumbnail a about him, but he gone. is wild and crazy. But like, so he claimed to be a like, you know, like an astrophysicist and worked, at, uh, you know, on Area 51. Mm -hmm. And that he was developing a relationship with a great alien called J-Rod. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love. I love that it had a name. And uh, he was kind of, you know, he was repeating a lot of the story. I think he even said the whole thing about Tibetan music. They like Tibetan music, which he got from Dodie, because yeah. Dodie was the one who said the Tibetan yeah. music thing. And strawberry ice cream. And, yeah. And I, I think he probably didn't, you know, have the gall to say the strawberry ice cream, knowing that was Dodie territory. But Burrish also, like, I kind of like follow these people as much as I can. I'm always checking up on him. But like a couple of years ago, he had a website up and it was like him and his wife were like were part of some like Mossad strike team that was like sent around the world to do like, you know, Rambo type strikes on assassinations on world leaders and like it sounds just like some crazy project, shit. Project Camelot nonsense. Oh, that's where I heard about Dan Bush. <laughs> oh, so you nailed it. Complete. Yeah. I think I think this that is, is where this is very much up Carrie Cassidy as well. You and I share that in common where I think when we first started talking, you know, like you referenced uh Project Kim, I'm like, I'm like well, I've unfortunately seen every one of those, at least the original <laughs> series with Bill Ryan. And I and like oh, that was God. by that time I was definitely very skeptical, but I found them just damn entertaining. Like yeah. <laughs> they were so crazy. Well All they these soldiers they and, Oh yeah, well that's I because when I was putting together the alternative three documentary, I spent months just looking at the Kerry Cassidy Project Camelot stuff and watching all those. But she really like in the world of super soldiers, she's really like one of the one of like those those people like hugely influential. Big time. 
in that yeah. in that world because she brought on all of these oh, yeah. so-called whistleblowers and she's also like very much like she was very it was like early 2000s right or it was mm-hmm. early to late 2000s it, so, was, so, it was it was early 2000s ish i think yeah so it was it was really kind of around that era that like everybody started to get Facebook and social media was just kind of becoming a thing. Right. And Kerry Cassidy comes onto the scene with all of these characters, none of whom have been vetted. Yeah. All of them have got some military credentials. Yeah. She shoves the camera in their face and they will just go for hours and tell you yeah. all, all of these different stories. I actually, after I... Um, made that alternative three documentary i had one of the uh one of her whistleblowers reach out to me because i said in the video i was like what did i say i'm trying to find the <laughs> i <laughs> i basically said like if you're still out there i'd love to talk to you and it was about duncan o'finian oh yes. was like, <laughs> yeah the long hair i i, yeah. I remember and he, yeah he's one of the super soldier whistleblowers he dm'd me on what? twitter about a year ago and he's like hi you wanted to talk to me <gasps> and i asked him about um i asked him uh he he was very much like it was one word answers from him but i did ask him did you ever get to meet david wilcock and he said yes and i asked what did you make of him and he put lol i'd rather not say <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting you bring up Wilcox because, like, Wilcox was featured early on, I believe, in Project Camelot. Yeah. And Gary Cassie really was promoting people like yes. him and Corey Good. Yeah. So I yeah. kind of think she was almost the start of that she kind was- of. You know, she was she was very much the start of like the more modern day. Um, see. When we get into super soldiers, it's like the history of it is just like obviously it it takes a lot of inspiration from MK Ultra, Project okay. Stargate, and yep. new, uh, what's it, New Earth Battalion. Yep. You know, like actual things, actual programs that are looking for to make actual super soldiers. So there has right. to be like a distinction, right? Because the reason why these things work so well is because they take things that are real uh-huh. and then it just twists it as we like to say, shit coats it, right? Yeah. Yeah, Take yeah. something that's real, completely obscure the truth of it. Um, so it, it obviously is born out of that, but mainly comes out of the, the idea um, of uh, going away for like 20 years and then coming back, popularized by Montauk. As far yeah. as I know in my research, I might be wrong, but Montauk were the first people to talk about um they they wrote about uh, how the earth has got 20 year biorhythms mm-hmm. and that this montauk uh the the um i can't remember the details off of my head but essentially to to open this like time warp it's used in like 20 years so that's where like the concept of like this this like 20 year thing came from then after that there was a guy who was really good friends with al Bielik, oh, who yeah. um was called Michael Ralph and he was like he put out this thing called the Mars records right where he claims that he was part of the fictional documentary alternative three um or at least he claims that alternative three is real because alternative three is the fake documentary where they go to Mars um and he claims that he's part of it 20 year mission you come back you've regressed and you're put into a different body which is essentially what Corey Good said right 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 um so all of that is kind of born born out of those stories, David Wilcock really heavily into um, Montauk stuff. It, it just is all kind of like amalgamated over the years. But this yep. kind of modern iteration, um, absolutely, in terms of like the video stuff, modern like video video stuff. Um, Kerry Cassidy, I I definitely say that she's one of the she's a people responsible a pioneer in it for better or for worse. And oh I mean, yeah. Like, I will say this. There is like something, you know, maybe it's because I'm getting older, but I'm nostalgic for the look and the vibe of those videos oh, yeah. where it was in usually like it was in, she was probably capturing a lot of this at like UFO conferences, but they were yeah. always in ho- like dingy hotel always. rooms. Always. It's like always. a loud, a loud air conditioning in the background with yeah. terrible sound. Like the camera was like slightly boy, out of focus. The, and, like, the boy that she had on, he was like 12 years old and he was like boy from... <laughs> Mars or something where he was like I can't remember what, what he his was name? Yeah, I can't remember but I totally know what you're talking oh about oh my god and it's that so is, bad I mean, there's just so many of them like that's a horrible thing I know. to do like, awful what are people that had like had their 
DNA mixed with dolphin DNA and been part of Project Seagate or something. Yeah. And, oh my god. I and saw I her. About once. It, it just drives me crazy. Oh, I saw her in LA. Once. I did. I saw her in LA. I one time. <laughs> I mean, it was like 2008. And my, I convinced one of my buddies to go to the Conscious Life Expo down by LAX, which nice. supposedly also is where the jump room is at one of the Boeing <laughs> buildings. So we were, you know, we were in a good location. Uh, but I remember, like, I, you know, I, I was in my wild boy years, and I ate like a nice. gigantic pot brownie, and went to the Conscious Life Expo, which was kind of a great move. It was perfect, and <laughs> and I saw Carrie Cassidy there, and I was like wow i have to go meet her like she was some a celebrity to me even though i didn't really like i didn't like what she was doing but still i'd watched so many videos like i, I was like starstruck by her <laughs> oh my gosh the risk of the indigo boy <laughs> the indigo That's boy the <laughs> yeah of course he knows oh, yeah. <laughs> Christ almighty. i'm gonna it's end just... up watching all these again damn it like <laughs> but but then the but the new iteration of Carrie Cassidy is like James Frank, Super Soldier Tool. Yeah. I don't know if you've watched any. any I'm familiar him. with I haven't gone down that. He's that so yet. he's like a he's a Montauk boy. And again, like all of these all, all of these people are have been involved in Montauk, obviously. They've recovered their memories of being involved in Montauk. James Rink's like one of the few who actually met Preston Nichols. There's a mm. video on YouTube of him going to Preston's house and being put in Preston's bed because oh, Preston God. like rigged up. Okay, I know why would you want to do that? Yeah. He rigged up this bed like electronically and he'd just blast people with the, uh, both like opera music and metal and then like recover their memories of it. The jerking off didn't happen on the on this video. That how, obviously how was behind the scenes. did he not go to jail? Like I mean it is well that's it but this, this is the thing right i've seen the only time i've ever seen um allegations of like this was done to me against my will was like maybe a couple of people in right. comment sections apart from that it's all just kind of like people saying like oh yeah that's just what he did but he misled you know, like, people i mean like it, it still yeah. seems like very like not above board <laughs> i mean no it yeah it's crazy. absolutely not and like either way that you slice it because i don't think that these people have been involved in like the these programs but um i think you're dealing with people who have got some mental things going on yeah, yeah. they go to this guy that says you know i'll help you recover your memories like the, you're having these problems because you are you've been involved in in this horrific and this is the other thing right that always gets me about montauk montauk appear the montauk uh, project story appeals to um a lot of people that are like uh, um, the, kind of like the save the children crowd. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way, just people that are like, this is what they did to children. They did experiments. Satanic so panic control. people, yeah. yeah. But like mind control experiments on, on children, that kind of stuff. Right, right. Which I have, which, which by the way, did actually happen. And again, like trying to like reel myself in from ranting, yeah. but there is part of me that also thinks that maybe Montauk is like a shit coat, if you right, will. Right. Because there were people like Andrea Puharik who, who yes. was doing experiments with children in a house in Ossining, New York. Yeah, and even um, Jolly West, some of the stuff he was doing. I mean, there's a lot right? of like... Right? Know... A lot of this going on. Yeah. Um, But the thing that gets me about this is like people were like, look up the Montauk project. It was this evil project with these children and that all these horrible things would happen to them and their minds would be split into alternate personalities and blah 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 blah. and i'm like the person telling you all this is the guy that says that he did it how come he's allowed to that that's the thing that baffles me i'm like Preston nichols was going around to all of these ufo conferences saying uh, saying like oh yeah this story is true well in the thing he's saying that he was involved in programming children I've been doing horrific things to children, kidnapping them off the street, bringing them in, mind control. But, but everybody in the UFO community was like, oh, yeah, come in, Preston. Tell yeah. us your story. Yeah. We believe you. Yeah. It's like I even said in my Montauk um, video, I was like, if I had to give be given the choice between like, you know, like um, do these horrible things to because Preston was like, he, he would say like, oh, we had to do this stuff because he was part of this program. I'm like, if someone said to me, you've got to harm all these children or you, you're going to die, I'm going to be like, I'll choose the death. 
Oh, yeah. I'm not. I'm not hurting any children. I had a good run. Kill me now. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, but everybody was just like, "Yeah, come in, presents." Like, tell tell us about how you did all that stuff to Joe. But it, in the books, it's like written like they they did it. Like Preston was involved in it. But when he spoke about it in like conferences and stuff, it all just sounds it sounds very disconnected. It just is. It, it was just bizarre, like cognitive well, dissonance that you could allow a man like that to come in. I hear you, and like yeah, I'll tell you, Emily. It's like it's but it's it's funny. You, you know these people. People, especially when they the more salacious their stories and theories and like quote unquote proof is the more people have a hard time like kicking them out of their life so i mean like like while i'm surprised that to this day there are still a lot of people who take david wilcox seriously at the same yeah. time i'm not surprised because i think a lot of people just have like fallen in love with that narrative yes. to such a degree where they're like under no circumstance there's nothing he could do yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot like a lot of uh, one of the presidential candidates from this country. We know he's done all these horrible things. Yeah, people are like, I don't care if he kills somebody in front of me, kills my kills my grandma. You know, like, it's just yeah. there is this like. It's called um, personality. Yeah, it's it, it, yeah. I feel like right now, I, I, you know, it, it's mind boggling, especially when you're, you know, comparing it to the, the current state of, you know, ufology. It's mind boggling to me. Mm -hmm. that a lot of these narratives are still popular and having a lot of influence on people. And it, it makes me sad a little bit. You know, I feel sorry for him, you know. It's it's crazy to me that people still believe it in the story of Montauk. And I don't know whether that's like because the, the real story of it hasn't been that that like well known. But I, I it just it is but I, I but and again maybe people believe in it because there are there are grains of truth. Right. In that story, and, and, and right. the thing about it, like, while it's not well known, I mean, w the biggest show ever for Netflix is based off Montauk. I mean, like, yes. you know, so whether exactly. it's just because it's fake, it, it's it doesn't mean that it hasn't had a significant cultural influence. Yes. It has even all these hoaxes. Like, I mean, the whole, even just like the idea of Area Fifty One, that kind of almost created this whole like narrative of secret bases. And like, I think we yeah. did we don't have Dulcie until we, you know, like I think. Area 51, and then you get Dulce, and then you start getting these other military bases and these other underground things. It has to start somewhere, and when it mm -hmm. does, it just never goes away, and it starts to get muddier and muddier and, like, more blurry, like, from where it came from. But, like, these things do have, like, whether they're totally fake or not, it doesn't even matter because the amount of, like, It has real-world influence. Sure Montauk kind of did as well. Like, there's a guy, um, I mean, give too don't go too much into the story because it's for a project at some point um but a guy that ran a ufo uh he ran the long island ufo network his name's john ford um and he was uh a very interesting character a lot of like conflicting character reports about him and um, but he was very friendly with preston nichols and he ran this like ufo society on Long Island, went out and investigated UFOs and stuff. Kind of, he was believing in the Montauk story, and he believed that there was something really nefarious going on at Brookhaven National Labs. And he would ring up, ring them up constantly, and you know, be like, "What's going on there? You've got aliens in there." You know, like he thought that there was aliens there. Anyway, he was also very much involved in like local politics, and um, at some point i want to say 1996 um and he was involved with some and, and this is really complicated well, it's not complicated but it's a it, longer story than what i'm alluding to and there's a lot of weird characters involved in this story um but he became embroiled in a plot to sprinkle radium in the car and like in put it in toothpaste and um, potentially what? in the food of local Republican politicians on Long Island, and he um, he was involved with like these two other two other people got arrested with him in 1996. He's still being held to this day over that. He never killed anyone. He um, they said that the plot wouldn't even have worked because it would have taken 40 years for the uranium to take effect. He's not being held in jail; he's in a mental health facility because um, he was declared like unfit. Um, I mean, unfit to stand trial. Yeah. Um, 
he's as far as I know he's still alive and I think he's he's being held at a, at a psychiatric facility but up until 2019 he was in a very high security um facility and then he got moved to somewhere that's slightly um slightly less um uh, high security but there's a lot of like conflicts in reports about him because a lot of ufologists people like elaine douglas kind of really came to his defense uh-huh. and you know a lot of people say that he was railroaded um and i think that there maybe is a very small truth in that I, i'm very on the fence about this because it's right. still like a subject that i'm exploring for a later project at some point but they he was involved with some very interesting characters one of the guys involved in this who was suspected of getting him the radium worked at northrop grumman and he went to jail i think for maybe of he went to jail for a very short time and then got out um one of the other guys involved in the plot got out the one of the guys that john ford tried to kill later got put in jail because um he had been involved in like a chop shop operation on long <laughs> island and there was all this corruption going on there i mean it, the, the story is just nuts oh my god it's nuts um but john ford also from the people that knew him and some of the people that was involved in like his very uh in like the early days of the long island ufo network they describe him in not very nice terms so they're very kind of that you know they say that he was very unhinged and had unhinged behavior and he was very much pally pally with the montauk crew preston nichols would go out with him on investigations when he was arrested preston nichols was all over the news because he was being interviewed because he was like john ford's best friend um yeah no crazy story that nobody that is a very i did not know that that is a very crazy story yeah because a lot of people you know a lot of people talk about a lot of the rhetoric and how it can lead you down a path and stuff and i'm like well john ford's kind of the perfect example of that because yeah the poster boy yeah the fact that he's still being held somewhere i mean it it, that that's always one of those things where i mean i'm sure there's more examples of like uh you know people in the Montauk world and the UFO world, when they get busted for something horrible, there's always those people like, they didn't do it. It's a setup. Like the whole, I think of Stan Romanek. Mm. You know, do you remember him? He was like, yeah, I I've think got that, his, um, like, I've got his, uh... Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I have that one. Yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. like, I, remember he, I haven't he, read this. I bought this he recently. Like, he was like actually. eating himself up. And then like, He's also, was, like, isn't he a, um, and he was, I think he like, you know, got, he's in jail for like, yeah, you know, not yeah. the worst thing ever. This, so. The same thing that Wendell St- Stevens um, got put in jail for, but everybody supported him. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people supported him when he came back on the scene. He's a pedophile. Got invited to, yeah, got invited to UFO conferences. It's um, astounding. Yeah, he's another great example where people are like, no, he didn't do that. Yeah. I like his stories too much, you know. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. And people just welcome them back with like open arms. Yeah, and it is it, it alarming amount of people um, that have had like convictions, allegations um, uh, uh, to do with um, that. I'm trying to like skirt around saying I know. it for I know. yeah, but you know what yeah. I'm yeah. you know what I'm saying. Window um, Stevens stuff. Yeah. And just like, I mean, I was reading because I saw all of Saucer Smear got put online recently. I know. And I, and I started reading, going through that. Oh, it's yeah. There's, so some, awesome. there's some great tidbits. Oh, but like the this. way that they write about it in that is like, they're like, they, they really skirt around like what he went to jail for. Oh, it's and it, in a way that's like really disturbing because it's yeah. like how much was that person enabled but um Ugh. this is an interesting comment about um one of the guys uh involved in the john ford case working at northrop grumman uh tal levesque worked for northrop so he did Rupelt. there's more yeah oh tal levesque he's one of the protagonists from the wonderful book saucer spooks and kooks by oh, yeah. edgar Riley. i love that book it is a great book oh, like, that's delightful. like one of the it, i would say that mirage men um project beta as well yeah 
Yeah, that's a great trilogy right there. I mean, those yeah. are like must reads for anyone interested yeah. in this stuff, I think. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I would say like Martin Cannon's The Controllers, Tanner's Substack, Getting Spooked. Oh, yeah. Um, I love Tanner's work. All of that kind of stuff. Um, that <clears throat> they, they kind of focus on the disinformation angle. Yep. yep. Wow, we've been like all over the <laughs> We really have covered a lot, yeah. <laughs> Bloody hell, I've got whiplash from this conversation. Can I, can, I, can I ask you a question just because I feel like you may know. You okay, so we know Jamie Chandra disappeared, you know. From so for the people, because I'm just so conscious that not everybody's going to know. Okay, um, uh, well, you know, you know, he he was involved with the whole MJ12 thing. I mean, I'm yes. a huge, hugely involved in it, it with Bill Moore and... He was even in. He was in UFOs. To, uh, the the 1988 show, the UFOs. Uh, oh God, what was it called? UFO Cover Up Live. Thank you. UFO Cover Up Live. Yes. He was in that, and he was just. I mean, for a you know a handful of years, he was a very serious player in UFOs. He and, received the MJ12 documents in yeah, the mail. Like a little film strip in his mailbox, before. supposedly. Yeah, right? yeah. But after Bill Moore, you know, kind of dropped the hammer at the uh, MUFON conference in 89, I think, mm -hmm. or 88, he seems like both of them hung on for a little while and then they ju yes. both just vanished. And I know just because I have some friends who still keep in contact with Bill, Bill's alive and, you know, he just stepped away from ufology because he's like, enough. But Shandera, like, I don't know what happened to him. No, I, well, I think I said this on your podcast, the story that Doty told me, which is obviously nonsense, but still, I think it's, um, I think it's funny that he got, um, that Jamie Shandera, or whatever you want to call him, Shandera, Shandera, debate on like how to, um, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> I say both. Apparently, he tried to infiltrate naval base Coronado in San Diego, That's and when right. he got found out there, he said that he'd been dropped there by a UFO. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You know, and that's a great way to bow out of the <laughs> UFO scene, you know, like oh my God. <laughs> what a great But exit. apparently he had like a bunch of I don't I don't know what happened to him, but again, like who knows? And again, I hate to sound like the most paranoid person in the world, but how do you even know that Jamie Shanda at Shandere was even his real name? You know? Right. I mean, he's got an IMD. I, mean, I will say this, like, just from the little research I've done, he does have a couple IMDb credits because supposedly <laughs> he, you know, was I, th I think I think it was like more mostly softcore pornography. He was a producer, right. of. <laughs> but there is definitely, and they did say he was a filmmaker. And I, I, you know, I know someone. I mean, I'm not going to say the name because I don't know if they want me, you know, attributing it to them. But like, who definitely says that he he was like a real person that was the same, right? But I don't I don't know how they know that. <laughs> but um, yeah, he was one of those guys. I will say I did look it up, and and I do know someone did tell me he is still alive he's very old now but right. man i would do anything to hear like an update from him or an interview and just kind of like what have you been up to man <laughs> and, like I what do you think like, what do you I think now like, like about all this stuff i feel like at some point there needs to be like a right an mj12 round table oh god all the questions Let's get them answered. But then uh, then my other brain, my, the other part of my brain, brain goes, we, you're just going to be fed another round of nonsense. Yeah. yeah, you yeah. Know? yeah. But, but I would eat, <laughs> I would eat it up. I would, I would be there for it. I would, I would pay a lot of money for that pay-per-view. It would be interesting. It really hard. I wonder if like, because I know that you said Bill Moore keeps in contact with um, Greg Bishop. I wonder if Bill Moore, if by any chance he's, he would ever watch any of these, I he would be the one person that I'd be so interested to talk to just because of his involvement in so many of these things, not even just the MJ 12 stuff. Like for me, like Philadelphia experiments, totally. infinitely fascinating. Right. Um, yeah. And also Martin says, Steve, you once said that you wanted to play Bill more. You should I know that Bill never laughs. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's that would be the great acting challenge of my life, but I do feel yeah. like, you know, and I'm not trying to be, Whatever, you know, maybe, maybe I couldn't pull it off as an actor. Maybe I don't have the chops, but I'd like to try. But I feel like I have the right Bill Moorish look, you know? Darken my hair a little bit, maybe a, <laughs> some glasses, a tan suit, like, you know, shaggy. You're an actor. You can 
think I think the little that. bangs. I think I could pull off the Bill Moore yeah. look. I and I, I, I honestly, I had I've always had this idea for like a low, like kind of a low budget indie movie where the movie literally starts with him walking out of the auditorium after the 1989 Buffon. It, it, like you know, and then someone will play I, Greg. I think... Greg Bishop was literally <laughs> was literally running his merch table. So you know, Greg Bishop is also kind of one of those Walter Mitty guys where he was around tangentially to a lot of this stuff. And I'm not saying he's not a suspect individual at all. Like he's actually like my UFO mentor. But uh, I would find it so compelling not to make a U. Like I love the idea of making a movie about UFOs that has nothing to do with aliens. The people involved, which is the most interesting part of this whole thing. Oh my god, I I I couldn't agree more because that is something we can actually find out about. Yes, exactly. You know, like I I feel like it's like I'm never going to figure out what UFOs are, what they represent, if they're real, if they're not. I'll die. I'll die not knowing. I'm convinced of that. But what we can find out is is some of these storylines and the BS that's been like just put in there. And that is so fascinating on its own. It's a different part of the subject, but one that's so important. And Absolutely. I, I, I'll, I'm endlessly fascinated by it. As much as sometimes I don't want to admit it, I'm mm. deeply fascinated by the machinations of how all this information gets spread and how these narratives turn into belief systems and how these belief systems turn dangerous and fascist. And, you know, absolutely, it's wild. If you need a co-writer for this movie, we should talk. We should talk. I'm not even joking, like because I've been telling Greg for years I want to make a movie out of Project Beta because I think it would be an amazing, like, dark comedy yet like political thriller that has mm-hmm. a lot of twists and. T- I mean, you don't even need to add anything. Like the book, yeah. it's all right there. Like the whole story, you know. So yeah. it would make an amazing movie, I think. I definitely I'm so interested in like the Bill Moore idea I feel like you could do that like oh. I almost see that as like a short it could be a play it'd probably be a better yeah. like, one man show yeah like, <laughs> yeah that's that kind of yeah. is what I see it as like a, yeah. I see it as a play yeah a well, play it's, or a short film it's it's really my dream project if somehow like a bunch of money fell from the sky and you mm, know that's the that's the fucking problem isn't it money it is well yeah it's, no, it's just you know like people would say oh just make it into like a micro budget but even a micro budget film after it's all said and done, post production, everything, it's going to cost six figures. Like you know, and that's just yeah. a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I don't think that I don't know if that movie was like the kind of uh, UFO movie people are thirsting for. But yeah, I think exactly. we we would like it. <laughs> oh yeah, there'd yeah. be a, there's a very specific niche of maybe yeah. like you know, <laughs> yeah, hundred people that would watch it. All the people that are here now, <laughs> and, and we'd all love it. You know, and maybe that's enough. So maybe I'll go broke exactly. making this thing just for y'all. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's the thing. Like that, that's it's it's like the financial aspects of it, right? Like there's so many things that I would love to make, but it's yeah. just like you know, getting camera equipment and you know, all of all of that kind of it's stuff. It's so expensive. Yeah, even yeah. though like the equipment is cheaper now, it's still just so like getting locations, paying actors, and I don't want people to work for you know. It's just it's it's yeah. it's very difficult. I think one man play. I think like that's um, doable with some like, like side off, actors. Off Broadway, kind yeah, of thing. yeah. <laughs> Imagine, I mean, like, but it, it is it's it's something like I feel like I have to do, mm. you know, while I'm still able to maybe like get something done in the entertainment business is to yeah. do some sort of like UFO project, but not about aliens or the phenomenon per se, but more these kinds of fun like almost espionage type stories because there's yeah. i think it would really make a very entertaining movie yeah no i agree with you i i definitely i would watch it yeah and again if you need a co-writer hey you i i would i mean let's talk if you have i i would love i mean you you're a historian of this stuff and you're funny and you get it and i think you would see the angle i i would want to take with it which would be because i mean like even though a lot of these stories, there's trauma involved, there's people who were deceived and cheated and yeah. money stolen, it is still very funny to me. Like, you know, not not the trauma that people have experienced. But it's like, a, I, like, a, like a kind of Fargo-esque exactly. kind of black comedy. Yeah, yeah, and I find it absolutely hilarious. Because some of it is, is more kind of like the ridiculousness of it's some of it. It very lends itself to a to a... A kind of black comedy, yeah, right? I it's almost crazy. Like at this point, because we've seen so many aliens, uh, you know, attack Earth. Like I, I never want to see another movie about aliens, like you know, abducting people or attacking Earth. But I think these kinds of films, like, actually <laughs> would be a new take on the whole UFO movie. 
Absolutely. And Tenny's right here as well about making these kind of documentaries and talking to people um, that were involved in this. Everyone's in their 70s or 80s and they're going away soon. Yeah. No, he's know. not wrong. It's something I stress yeah. out about. Yeah. Yeah. There's I mean, like... there, there, he, he's so right because I mean, like, if someone's ever going to get Bill Moore to talk, like, you know, on the record or Jamie Shandera, they need to do it now because, mm -hmm. like John said, like they, you know, any day now, <laughs> you know, yeah. none of us are promised tomorrow, but like they are definitely not young people. Yeah. We're, we're about, you know, because we are, there's a lot of these people kind of in the boomer generation of you, you know, we're every year, a handful of them are passing away. And people who I would really love to hear their take mm. kind of in their later years, looking back on their life and Absolutely. research, and hear what they think now. It's like trying to track people down as well. Like I've been trying to track down Myrna Hansen, you know, from the Paul Benowitz. Thing. Absolutely. But oh. I just don't know. Again, you're dealing with people that have, that have, even if you don't believe that any sort of alien thing's been involved, these have been very highly traumatic incidents for yeah. people. So, you know, like belief or no belief, a lot of people aren't going to want to revisit right. this, you know, things that have caused them a lot of pain and anguish over the years. And especially with how, a, I don't mean to be disparaging, but how a lot of people in this field are, they mm. act like assholes. Yeah. And, you know, they hound people, they harass people. And I'm not surprised that somebody like her would be, would maybe go, I don't want anything to do with this anymore. This totally is get a time it. in my life that I don't wish to be reminded of. Right, right. I've moved but, on. From a historical perspective, I think that it would be, it's important almost. It, it would be. Like revisit and it would be also like important that. for a lot of people in ufology who sort of refuse to look at the other side of the mm -hmm. kind of stuff we're talking about. It would be good. It would be helpful and educational for them to learn about some of these stories, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think enough people are aware or if they're aware of it they're not aware of like the the intricate details of it you know? yeah yeah because mm -hmm. even when you learn this stuff it doesn't make me hate like ufos it really mm -hmm. doesn't it makes me happy that i'm like oh cool i thought something and now we know that's untrue great exactly I'm better for it. <laughs> and that's yes exactly and i think that's the thing it's like it's okay to change your mind it's okay to have i feel like that's that's something that should be encouraged like people change right like who you were 10 years ago is not who you are now who you were last year is not who you were now your feelings your um your opinions on things are going to revolve over time and i think Absolutely. that that's that's good. and and the best thing is like anybody that can be presented with ev new evidence and then can change their mind on something you know that isn't just like rigorously dogmatic and that goes for both sides 100%. skeptics and believers because I, I, on both sides there's such like dogmatism yeah I, I feel like anytime there's certainty involved in anything, mm -hmm. you know, ufologically related or paranormal or esoteric related at all, that's the wrong way to be, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Where, because, like, yeah. I feel like being open minded and radically skeptical, but open minded is kind yes. of the only way to like keep your sanity in this stuff. Absolutely. 100%. We have covered so much stuff. This has been so fun. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. I've kept you for two, two and a half hours. I wonder if, if anyone's got any questions, get it for Steve. Get them in now. Yep. Um, if you don't already, go check out his podcast, High Strangeness. Thank you. Um, hi as in, hi. <laughs> in hello. It's cute. It's cute. <laughs> it is. I love it. It's great. Thank you. It's it's become like one of the podcasts that I listen to when I'm walking. Oh, it's good. High strangeness. What's up, weirdo? Yeah. And then like the parapolitics podcast that like I listen to like 20 minutes. And I'm like fully absorbed, and then like my brain just there's so much information being given to me that I just kind of <laughs> I'm like so I have to oscillate between yeah. like different different things. But yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I, um, I, 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 I just, I love this stuff. I love these topics. I could talk about it for years. Since I kind of came out of the uh, weirdo closet, you know, a couple of years ago, it's been so mm -hmm. fun because I've got to meet, you know, folks like you. And I can't. I mean, like, I always dreamed of talking about these subjects for two and a half hours with someone like you. Yeah. Like, and so it is like, yeah, it's great. So fun for me. I can't tell you because I, I just love this stuff and. And it makes me feel in a way like validated for reading and studying this stuff for so many years. Because for so long, I had no one 
to discuss this stuff with. Same. And it was really lonely. <laughs> I was like always kind of like yeah. a little bit sad. And, you know, because yeah. like I, I bet, you know, for better or worse, cultivated uh, a lot of knowledge about this stuff. And it's yeah. just so damn fun to yeah. discuss it. So Absolutely. thank you so much. I really appreciate being on this. Where are you going to be um, be doing like your lectures and stuff? Do you have any like appearances coming up? Any conventions that we can find you? I need to get to um, one of these conventions. I feel like we need, I feel like there needs to be like an in real life meet up at some point. A big hang. Well, we should all Absolutely. pick. We, we should, you should find one you want to go to and then we'll all mm. meet up. We'll have some delicious, tasty noodles and just, you know, hang out and uh, sounds great. shoot the breeze about all this weird stuff. <laughs> uh, but I'm doing a uh, the Nebraska Bigfoot convention next month. Nice. And I'm really worried because it's a, you know, it's a very true believer crowd. Mm -hmm. And the way I usually talk about this stuff is like, I don't have a belief system wrapped up in this, but I love the stories. And I kind of like, you know, because I, I want to be honest, you know, and I don't mm -hmm. want, you know, I, you know, and so sometimes that has like, I think rub people the wrong way. I, I did uh, I did a lecture like this summer and it went really well. All the young people really loved it, but there were some old crusters there in about five <laughs> minutes. They were shaking their head and they just got up and walked out and they did not like me. And they were giving me dirty looks afterwards. Oh, Cause I was saying God. like, I don't know if any of this is true. I start, you know, I always like, you know, I'm like, but I'm here to tell you the stories that I've heard. It, you know, it's basically more of like a, I, I feel like it's like a more of a campfire story. Like, these are the fun stories about Nebraska, you know? So yeah, they all might be fake or they all might be real. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I definitely need to get to, I'm, I'm going to be at the, um, the Pennsylvania, uh, Bigfoot thing in June. Is that in it's Southwestern Pennsylvania? Like, like outside of Pittsburgh? I, uh, it's, it's near Pittsburgh. It's definitely near Ooh, Pittsburgh. It's that's like, Dan Gordon country right there. I think so. I, I can't remember which one it's called. Uh, let's look it up. Pennsylvania. Well, I will say uh, my wife is from that area, so I know a lot about that area because I'm fascinated by it. That's the Chestnut Ridge. Forest that is... County, yeah. Forest oh, County yeah. Bigfoot yeah. Festival, yeah. You are, I mean, that is, yeah. uh, that's one of the, since the 70s at least, that's been one, a very high activity oh, yeah. place. That's also the area that Stan Gordon writes about where Bigfoot is seen in conjunction with UFOs. Yes. Which, yes, yes please. I've been That's meaning wonderful. to get out. I've been meaning to get out to see the little acorn thing. The next, I'm, I'm, I'm in yeah. that area. Well, it, going to be there in May. So. It's a cute. You'll be, you'll be right in that area. I, I've been there, and it's adorable. It's a tiny town, and the, I mean, the you go see it, and it's not like that impressive, but it's yeah. still, it's still one of these things where it's fun to go see it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We need to do like a. Uh, a more like paranormal UFO convention. Contact in the desert. Whoa. Everyone yeah. go there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it would be Everybody fun. Everybody chip in. It'll go, you know, the tickets will only cost like five grand. Oh my God. Know. It's so expensive. It's like as expensive <laughs> as like doing a CE5 with Greer. You know, it's yeah, basically it's like, great. yeah, give me a, you know, just a quick, you know, for the VIP package, which is like a fish taco lunch. You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm not even joking. I remember seeing like an ad for it. It was like $5,000 to go. But for seventy five hundred dollars, you got a you got you got invited to a taco bar. Oh my god! I mean, it's just it's wonderful stuff. <laughs> These people are making so much money. It's so much money. Insane. I know. I know. I'm doing the wrong thing with my life. I know. My God. Well, thank you so much for all of your time. Oh, thank you. It's been so wonderful. Fun. I've loved having you on as a guest, and uh -huh. we have covered uh, so much stuff. And you're going to have to come back I would for the love second to. season. I would so love These are going to be like running until like beginning of May. And then I'm going to take like a five week, five or six week break and then do another, another like run of them. So you have to come back. I'm so glad you're doing it because it's so fun. I, I watched the first episode you did with Tanner, who's wonderful, and I'm excited he's going to be on my show. But that was Yay. so much fun. It was just fun to hear, like, two people who know so much just kind of shoot Riffing. the breeze. Riffing. Yeah. And, like, I, I, <laughs> well, I do. I love the uh, back-and-forth conversational format. That's kind of yes. how I try to model my show because that yes, is, that's absolutely. just what I prefer. You know, that's what I like. So, yeah, same. yeah I, I'm, I'm so happy you're doing these, and I will never miss one. So, Yay! great <laughs> well thank you so much and thank you to everyone that has um been watching so many lovely people in the chat i appreciate all of you you're all so lovely and wonderful and i will see you all next week where we'll have another guest yes and yeah and don't be so, ridiculous <laughs> don't be ridiculous all right bye everyone bye
Bye.